Greetings, fellow Amblemites. Tiki here. And Blue Dragon 5. And Santa Claus. And Gabby. And welcome to the second season of Spielberg Month on the Main Street Cinema, the show where we discuss the finer points of filmmaking. Since Steven Spielberg does not do commentaries on his own films, we've decided to do the heavy lifting and uncover the hidden treasures and secrets within five of Steven's best movies. From mashed potatoes to Jeff Goldblum's, from premonitions to big friendly giants, batten down the hatches as we dive into another installment of Spielberg Month. Oh God! <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're we're not talking. We're not doing ET. Of course, we did ET last year, but I wanted to keep oh ET alive in spirit. <laughs> okay, folks. So welcome back to Spielberg Month. We're doing this. This is more like Spielberg Week and a half, in all honesty, because we've got a lot of you know we had kind of a hectic first half of the month trying to deal with the copyright crap. But we're back on. We're back on. You know, we're back on the same page. We're back on speed here. Uh, so Spielberg Month is going to be towards the end of June, but it will still be happening all in June. So our first installment, folks, our first installment is something that we really should have done last year's Spielberg Month. You know, maybe maybe done this instead of the Terminal hey. Dragon. <laughs> I still defend the terminal. That was a good movie. Yeah, I, I won't defend the terminal. Shots <laughs> fired. Um, we are in, we are discovering close encounters of the third kind. Oh god, oh god. So this, of course, is a seminal Spielberg classic. But I feel like it's a Spielberg movie that it doesn't necessarily get overlooked. But I feel like a lot of movies in his filmography kind of overshadow it. So, Dragon, do you have any backstory before we get into it? Of course I do, yes. Backstory's your life, man. Go for it. All right, folks. Here's, here's how we got the, the famous film, of course, is Close Encounters of the Third Kind. So essentially, as the boil it down here, Steven, uh, Steven Spielberg had, this con had the concept for this very movie for many for many years. The origin was, uh, and the scene, again, various, uh, various scenes in this film depict the origin of this project, is that uh, in real life, Steven Spielberg, as a boy, his father, a <laughs> In the middle of the night, uh, woke up all, all Spielberg and his and, and his uh, brothers and sisters. Uh, sisters, I forget if he has any brothers. They only had sisters. Anyway, the point is, wake up the whole Spielberg clan in the middle of the night. They're all groggy. He's like, what time is it? It doesn't tell them the time. He drags them out and basically he puts like a picnic blanket out and basically they watch a meteor shower. And this is oh the wow, nice, nice in space and kind of the stars and what lies beyond. It's the origin of that. So that's that scene is this is the the main origin point of this film. Then we get um, as Spielberg you know, goes on like this this idea and kind of that that idea of kind of what what else is out there. He's exploring the film in a way, and bear in mind, he's always working on this in the back of his mind. But uh, the first time we ever saw this kind of come out is kind of our main uh, homage to our main image here is a uh, get a short film called Firelight and a short film called, uh, called Firelight. Of course, is very notable for having a kid who opens a door with like, just this big shining light outside of it. Which, of course, uh, is a hallmark image of, of Close Encounters. So let's see. So he really was developing the idea. He's been developing the idea into a film ever since uh, Sugarland Express uh, and uh, all the way wow. through Jaws with Richard Dreyfus. Hence, Richard Dreyfus' role in this film. They were the two. They were, the two of them were talking things over and bouncing ideas off of each other throughout the, throughout the film. Mm -hmm. And uh, the concept uh, began as just kind of like, again, broadly just kind of about UFO culture. But then after, uh, you know, Watergate happened, then you have like kind of the conspiracy element introduced to it all. So that's, that's where a lot of that, uh, that came from. Just that mixture is what gives you a close encounters for the most part. And of course, this conspiracy element is something that they'll play with later in E.T. Like, I feel like this in a lot of ways Absolutely. Was was like a more like a more ambitious and artistic version of E.T., although not quite as lovable. Certainly, certainly. Yeah, I mean, you're right. There are a lot of, obviously, E.T. does, does uh, a lot of the genesis of E.T. is, is born in this film. Actually, uh, E.T., uh, the, the concept of E.T. actually was a deleted idea at the end of this film. Yeah, like, I feel like the ending of this film and E.T. are almost kind of mirrors of each other in a lot Very of ways. Very true. Uh -huh. So let's see. So uh, just like into uh, so obviously now this is important. So after Jaws, obviously Jaws being the huge mega success it was, that gave Spielberg a lot of cachet, a lot of clout in Hollywood. So especially with uh, Columbia, who I believe made this film, 
And uh, basically, and he could cast any actor he wanted. So he he went to a lot of the big names on this one. He wasn't like kind of like you know looking. He wasn't like uh, pouring his heart out to a uh, Roy, Roy Scheider <laughs> to, to, to be in Jaws. Like anyone, like he went to Steve McQueen, who was his first choice for, for the main character of, uh, of Roy. And uh, Steve McQueen said, "Oh, man, again, that's a that's a big deal. Get a meeting with Steve McQueen. Let's let's make let's make that clear." And basically, McQueen says, "This is a wonderful script. I, I love it, but you know, uh, I can't do because I can't cry on cue. And you need the tears at the end of this movie for for the Roy characters. I, I'm sorry, you, I, I won't I won't damage your film. You guys, you guys." Gotta, <laughs> so again, that was a real that was a real admiral thing that McQueen did there. And then he goes to, goes to all the other Hollywood bigwigs. He goes to uh, Al Pacino. He goes to Jack Nicholson. Goes to Gene Hackman. Oh, the wonderful Gene Hackman. And they all. Basically, they're all not cut out for him. Here's the funny thing: uh, Richard Dreyfus, uh, you know, again, he's been talking over the thing very casually, even after Jaws. Like, again, he's always been kind of his confidant on this project. So basically, uh, Dreyfus, he uh, he keeps he, basically he he secretly wants it. He just basically, says, you, know, you, you don't you don't want those guys. I mean, you know, Nicholson is gonna he's gonna be he's gonna give you a run around that sort of thing. And basically, <laughs> eventually, he, they, he, he kind of talks Spielberg into, into putting him in the movie. And of course, just based on like, all the work he kind of contributed to the movie, of course he's gonna put him in the movie. He seemed very right for the part. Just all the casting in general for for the for the players, they all wanted. Uh, Spur really wanted like a very uh, very young looking cast. Like they feel like kids almost, like a very kind of childlike innocence with the cast. Mm -hmm. You know, get with almost all the characters in, in a way. Uh, just to boil it down, there were a lot of various writers, and for some reason they were uncredited. Only Spielberg is credited because there were at least four different writers. They went through four. You had Paul Schrader, uh, who wrote Taxi Driver. You had uh, John Hill, who was a TV writer. David uh, uh, David Geiler, who, Ned, this one's the guy that really brings, he, uh, I, I assume it was from this this movie, actually. Uh, David Geiler, he, he writes all the Alien movies. Okay, okay. Which came after this movie, so you got to wonder, you know, how much of that's connected there. Sure. And uh, Jerry Belson, uh, who did fun with Dick and Jane, the original version. The point is, he and Spielberg work together. In the end, Spielberg, uh, he kind of does a draft of, and that's the one he gets, uh, gets, gets, gets credit for. There's a big title battle with the studio, because for the longest time, they're going to call it Kingdom Come, or variously, Kingdom Come, and, and the Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Is that you feel? <laughs> that, uh -huh. was, that, was one, that was the only thing you really had to fight Columbia on, because it, it was a risk for Columbia, but they put their, their, their stock in Spielberg, and... And uh, in the end, of course, it all it all paid off. It top and basically, Spielberg was the James Cameron of his day with films like this and everything onwards. You got to remember the early Spielberg in in his career, he was topping himself constantly at the box office as being the highest gross. Oh yeah, film. oh yeah. <laughs> so this is the first time I believe he topped himself from Jaws, and then then of course E.T. and everything, and various other things uh, onwards keeps topping himself. And James Cameron of his day. So that's kind of that's that's the that's the main crux of the concept of Close Encounters of the Third Kind. All right, and of course, as you said, this was a big follow-up to Jaws, so he kind of had free reign to do whatever he wanted. And as I said, I think even more so than Jaws. Like, Jaws kind of set the modern blueprint for blockbuster filmmaking Absolutely. in general. But I think this this basically made the blueprint for a Spielberg movie, if that makes sense. Debatable even for the, just the sci-fi alien movie, period. Sure, sure, Definitely. Like for example, I think I, I think a lot of parallels to this can be found in uh, something like Arrival. Anyways, sure. folks, uh, so we're we're done with the backstory. Let's set up the commentary. So, essentially, what we do here on Spielberg Month is we do, of course, do the audio commentaries for the films because Stephen, we love you, buddy. But you know, come on, give us some commentary love. We're here to pick up the slack for you, man. Because we love you. Why? But uh, wait, did you just call him Spielberg? <laughs> <laughs> well, I said Spiel, but you know, I guess yeah, Spiel would be the more. I think okay. A, I think Spielberg, or I, I think Spiel would be better than Spiel. You're right. <laughs> I, I can see on that point. Yes. Spiel. B. <laughs> how dare you call him Spiel? Get. But he's like everyone's. He's like everyone's film friendly uncle. Oh God. Oh God. Anyways. Anyways. So. <laughs> That's so the whole point of this is not just to provide a commentary track for Close Encounters, although obviously that's what we're going to be doing. But the point of Spielberg Month as a whole is to kind of see the, you know, kind of explore the connective tissue of the Steven Spielberg films and his entire filmography. So we'll be going back to films that, you know, we'll be referencing films that we already talked about. Of course, we've already referenced Jaws and E.T. I'm sure we'll reference those more as it goes on. So, uh, this is going to be definitely uh, a commentary on Close Encounters, but also a, you know, sort of a long-form discussion on the career and style of Steven Spielberg as a whole. Certainly. All right. Well, folks, we are going to be watching the director's cut 
This is important to note because it is two minutes longer than the theatrical cut. The timestamp should be somewhere right around two hours and 17 minutes. If you guys want to watch the commentary along with us, go ahead and sync your timestamp on whatever device you are watching this on to timestamp 000. I will count up from one to three and then say go when I say but, go. But of course, we're going to try to keep a conversation so you won't need to do that. But uh, again, of course, of course. Yeah, yeah. And we, like I said, we'll do our level best to keep a conversation. But uh, all right. But when I say go, go ahead and press play. All right. You guys ready? Yep. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> In one, two, three, go. Close encounters. All right. So this film just has such a deliberate build to it. That's one of my favorite elements. Yeah, it does. It does, doesn't it? It's oh, yeah. got a slow drive to it. I like. I don't think it's a boring movie. I think it's a very no. deliberate movie. I honestly didn't find it slow either, though. I mean, I think it went well. It it, it had. I think it had its slow points, but at the same time, it would cut back to different things that would keep you engaged. Yeah, and of course we'll get into it more as we talk through the movie, but I think the main character of Roy is definitely the driving force in the film, and I, oh, I yeah. honestly think he's one of the more underrated Steven Spielberg characters. Quite possibly, yes. I'm sorry, Dragon, you, you, you sounded... Dragon? What? what? Oh, it sounded like when I said Roy was a good character, you sounded kind of perplexed by that. <laughs> No, no, no! I he's uh, he's a uh, yeah, he's a good character. He's gonna be a good performance. I'm just saying, you know, it's on on the whole. This this movie, I think the rewatch. Uh, it's been many years since I've seen Close Encounters. I think collectively, we just kind of start off here. So collectively, we all know Close Encounters from the ending, of course, which is you know that's in, that's what kind of gets into like and the mashed the potatoes. Film. Yeah, the music here, the music here, it got me really excited. Like you had, you had this uh, these this strings, <laughs> yeah, the, the build up, the strings and the horns and everything. It made me think the music in this was going to be like extraordinary, but okay, I, I had to wait for that to go by. I couldn't hear myself. <laughs> Understood. I, I, I really wasn't impressed with the music in this all that much. It just seemed like it was, you know, all over the place. Okay, here's what I like about the score in this film. I feel like this score is... Uh... I really like how the score takes the one theme, which is, of course, that pattern that gets repeated throughout the film and uh kind of that's the driving force behind the score and that's what makes the score really work for me right here's an interesting fact originally they wanted to do this this whole opening in in the amazon the hmm. same same discovery just it was going to be in the amazon they couldn't afford it so they put it in some place much easier to shoot which would be uh you know the desert land this reminds me of the opening to jurassic park in a lot of ways not like the opening scene, but just specifically the scene with uh, the lawyer, like right. discovering the uh, the embryo. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think this is a great way to kind of start a film. Just kind of this uh, this this point of intrigue. It's like a great, it's like a cold open for for a movie, you know. Which uh, you know, obviously it's not too foreign a concept, but it's like you know, are we the first? That's a great way to kind of it's first great first line for the movie. Yeah, yeah, totally, totally. Yeah, well. Well, I was just kind of getting that it was broadly. I, was, I, was just like, I, I think I, I appreciate this film a lot better on, on the rewatch because it always just lo it looks beautiful. I, I feared it might have been stellar substance, but yeah, or on the rewatchers, obviously, they have these great, it's so well edited. You got a lot of really great pass. I will concede, I will agree with Sandy that there are slow points, and we'll get into those, I think, along the way. I think you always use trimming. How, how does this guy see? He's wearing sunglasses underneath his goggles, which are covered in layers of dust. Because it's called a movie, my darling. How does he see? Look at this guy. This guy. I thought he was Richard Dreyfus. I, yes. I, yes. He looks like him, doesn't Andy, he? I'm embarrassed for you. Now, this is uh, Bob. This actor is Bob Baladon, who is, if I believe it's his name, right? That is uh, Russell from Seinfeld. You remember the NBC executive in charge of Jerry and George's pilot for the folks mm -hmm. out there. That's why he looks mm -hmm. a little familiar. So uh, that's good old Lachlan here. He I kind of honestly was... like looks a lot like uh, like Hooper from Jaws. I I'm gonna I'm I very much agree with you there. <laughs> <laughs> Like at first, I thought it was that actor. <laughs> okay, okay. Wait, wait, wait. Oh snap! What? I'm thinking of the wrong guy here. Oh boy. Oh god. All right. The point is, uh, yes, he does look a little bit like Richard Dreyfuss, Tiki from from Jaws. Very, very true. <laughs> right, right. 
It ends up really kind of, this is a cool uh, opening. Of course, you do see a parody in a few places. I believe a Night Museum 3 parodies this opening a little. Okay, Tiki, I'm sorry. I, I'm thinking of the right, uh, the right guy here. You, yeah, yeah, you Hooper like from Cooper, Jaws. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You said it looks like Hooper, Hooper from Jaws, and that made Which me think he does. That it he like does look a lot like Hooper from Jaws. Exactly. Yes, That's why I, I thought it was the same. I guy. can see the confusion. Now, this is a really cool idea, and uh, it's it's the, the idea of this in real life. There was a missing flight that disappeared over over the Bermuda Triangle. And well, yeah, and just flights. Yes, exactly. I'm saying like you know, flight. There's like the idea is the whole collective flight nineteen. And uh, it's the idea of like kind of building kind of something that's from history, but adding kind of the slant to okay, what if we found them at some point? It's like kind of a great kind of like taking taking a page of history and adding some more intrigue to it. Right, right. Spielberg is kind of known for, it, as we see with the Indiana Jones movies, of course. You know, that's why he's always doing that stuff all the time, just kind of like adding an additional awesome page to the history. Yeah, I mean, he definitely does that like throughout his films. Uh, and of course, we'll get into some of the more historical of his films, but even in those, I feel like he. Uh, not necessarily like you know he doesn't em embellish but he does find a way to make those events very theatrical yeah now this there are several points in this movie where it reminds me a lot of raiders and this oh, yeah for sure one. exactly and again like maybe the point of genesis for a lot of that stuff possibly i have that exact same hat really <laughs> yes i do well it's also it's also kind of interesting yeah. that again, lucas has a very much of a of course, a big hand in, in Indiana Jones. It shows you like, kind of the uh, Indiana Jones was Lucas's baby, and Spielberg kind of brought it to life. And it's in a way like they both kind of came from similar kind of visual places on that. Sure, sure. I mean, I I, I don't know. I like the score. I think is more in line with a traditional John Williams score than the Jaws score is. But we were yeah. kind of we were kind of talking about this in the Jaws commentary we did last year, where. Like, of course, the Jaw score has obviously the famous, you know, the iconic piece of music that everyone knows, the Jaws theme. But a lot of that music is just very much like jaunty, sort of like, you know, like do 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 do. She's like sea shanty kind of music. Yeah, it's, it's like kind of it's like dun, 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 you know, it's like like on on the, not not sorry not just the main Jaws thing, but yeah, like you know, like we're off on an adventure sort of sort of vibe. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Whereas this, like, even though this isn't the most iconic of John Williams scores, and it's not the best John Williams score, I feel like this is the blueprint for the modern John Williams. Well, score. Speaking of John Williams, just of course, John Williams being a great student of Bernard Herrmann in a way, of course, as we all are. Uh, I just want to as uh, the kind of transition a little bit here. Of course, we have the wonderful and talented. Um, uh, Truffaut. Here, mm. Francois uh, 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 Truffaut. Yes, yes, this is a great character. As, as Lacombe. And of course, it's a very unconventional choice. He's got married. He shoulders a, a very important role in the film, yet, of course, you have a non English. No, you know, English as a first language is not really uh, Truffaut's forte, and that hence the translator. And like any filmmaker in their right mind would think, well, that seems like kind of an extra unnecessary step to take. But of course, just the way kind of Truffaut kind of adds these. You know, kind of adds like kind of that likability to him. Like he gives that smile. And this thing I appreciate a lot more on the, on the rewatch. It's like that we have all these great clues that that definitely pay off at the very end and throughout the film in places. Like we see the sunburn on on the on the old witness. And uh, yeah, definitely, definitely. And again, Truffaut. Then he looks at him. He gives him that that smile. Like that's the reason you get Truffaut in the role because Truffaut now he's a fantastic director. He's also one of the great stars. Essentially, he was kind of the Orson Welles, but if he if Orson Welles did more films in France. It's essentially, what Truffaut's. Uh, I'm sorry, Truffaut was French Hitchcock. That's the best word. You know, he and Hitchcock did that book together. I also feel like it gives a good role to the interpreter as sort of the voice of the audience. You know what I yes. mean? Where this guy's a little out of his field, and he's sort of like, you know, where where is uh, you know, where's Truffaut is uh, the uh, you know the the expert. So it, it kind of gives that give and take dynamic in a lot of ways. It, it does kind of lay, lay some trick for, uh, for, for Roy's character where, you know, it's this sort of like, he's a guy kind of like kind of thrown into this and just, he's a little scared of where he's going. In this. Sure. Sure. So it's like, everyone's just kind of thrown out of their element in this movie because of, because of these UFOs. So again, uh, again, this is just like you know, the film just does a great job of sort of like building the atmosphere, building the conspiracy. Yes. Of course, yeah, we already have the classic air traffic controller scene. Oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> not as intense as some we'd see in Breaking Bad years later, but of course, like very like oh my no, God, so Dragon, not as intense as that. <laughs> no, no. Scared to even ask. <laughs> 
No season payoffs on that one. <laughs> Enough with the Breaking Bad. All right, all right. All right. <laughs> Yeah, but this was a this is another cool idea here. Just like okay, uh, you know, where uh, everyone like the, the idea of UFO culture at this time is that you know just claiming that you saw a UFO would kind of paint you in a certain light, and you're just avoiding that. Like this, like the air traffic controllers here are asking, like, do you want to report a UFO? Uh, hello, can you hear me? He says no, no, it's the no, no, we don't want to report a UFO. <laughs> it's the very I really frame. love that of, idea. I, that idea, I feel like, is almost like a thesis statement for the rest of the film in a lot of ways. Yes. It's sort of like what the Roy character has to grapple with. Yes. Yeah, good stuff. Good stuff. I'm just sort of waiting for Roy to show up, to be honest with you. Honestly, there's, right. There there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff I want to get into with his character. Oh, should we uh take a minute to talk about the uh, differences in cuts here? I guess so, sure. I'm just saying to make sure we get in there to address, you know, the difference. Because I don't know anything about. about that. So essentially, there are three versions of this film, folks. We're talking about the director's cut, which is essentially, this is the third one released, and this is like Spielberg's preferred cut. This is like mm. his dream version. I mean, initially, the theatrical version was, he had his issues with it, and he wishes he could have, you know, touched up a, a certain amount of things. And, and years later, uh, kind of in light of all the special editions of Star Wars in the 80s, if I'm right, when this, when this one is. Um, when, well, when the, the special edition was, is that they... Um, Basically, uh, he went to Columbia asking if he can, you know, kind of touch up and add some add some things and kind of, you know, make some cuts he want, make some additions or cuts he wanted to make. It, but they said, yeah, sure, we have to market the special edition on something, so you have to show us what's inside the spaceship at the end, which is something Spielberg <laughs> oh, absolutely didn't want to do because you know it's the classic, you know, the audience is going to come with something a million times better than whatever you 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 can imagine. Right, right. And you know, he had the he had to craft something. And they market the crap out of it on that. And there were a few, basically, from what I've what I've heard, uh, the the uh, special edition has like much darker in in the in the middle for for Roy's character. Basically, we excise him going crazy, and uh, you know him like you know digging up the lawn and everything. From what I've heard, you know him digging up everything. Essentially, he was a real sad sh scene in the shower where he's just kind of like saying, "Oh God, I'm I'm so in my, over my head." And, and uh, Terry Gar's character, you know, Ronnie was was super just really mean to him mm -hmm. and uh just and basically so you know i'm tired of your crap it's turning up the house and she basically leaves with the kids the next morning instead of like leaving out of all the stuff he did okay folks and i'd like to present to you poltergeist 1.0 that's right folks it is poltergeist 1.0 just, just to clarify, everyone, what uh, Dragon was saying there. Basically, in short, there's three different versions, and the director's cut, which is the one we're currently watching, is the one Spielberg prefers. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, which doesn't have the <laughs> ending where you're going to see everything. I'm sorry, Dragon. I didn't mean to cut you off. I just really wanted to get into the scene where I also, th there's okay, so well, much poltergeist this, going on in the scene. This monkey, so why? Poltergeist. This monkey, why would you have that in your room in the dark? Well, it's <laughs> like the stand in for the poltergeist clown. It's like the creepy toy. Well, it's not a point of course. Creepy uh, tree in the window. <laughs> it's a very classic toy, of course. Um, why is a child getting out of bed, though? That's that's my concern. It's like, why is this child running around the freaking well, house? Well, I feel like because he's just compelled by the aliens. That's that's it, right? Honestly, like, if this was me, I'd be like, all right, I'm under the bed. Bye, everybody. This is a really good kid actor. Let's let's set that up. He is. He is. Actually, I had a nickname for him. One, one take carry. You know, the kid, uh, one take carry. Because you know, basically, they had the they, they couldn't really. It's not that they couldn't direct him. Good setup, good setup right here for the uh, for the dog door. Now the idea here, and I, if it's not this, I'm 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 really confused because the idea is like the aliens actually went in here personally and they were messing around with stuff, and, and actually they might be here in this exact scene was was what the kid's looking at right now. I think that yeah, I I'm pretty sure that's what's going on, and like I said, that's sort of why the kids compelled you know what i mean like and also i think there's definitely like a psychic connection this kid has with the aliens as well possibly like, yes he really picked a cute little child they, they, you know what's funny adorable. the way he looks up here looks at him the way they get this reaction he's a little scared first and he's all happy go lucky uh -huh. they, it's hilarious they had two guys one was dressed in the gorilla suit and one was dressed as a clown Oh, and, no. they, and they oh, were in no. crates, like the card, not crates. They were in cardboard boxes, and basically, in, when he walked in the scene, he stopped on his mark. They came out of the boxes, and that's why he's looking a little scared. And he's looking at the grill, and then the grill takes its head off, and it's a friendly guy he knew, and he's just he's all smiley at it. <laughs> that's how they uh, again, like the, this kid really was was uh, Spiller knew how to direct this kid, and, uh, and that's hence the one take carry things that he. Um, he, he not only did he take direction, but well, basically he would improvise, and he improvised so well. They oh only wow! Wow! One take. 
all, basically a lot of the stuff you see this kid do is improvised and they just kind of keep it the way it is because like we don't need to do another take it's perfect mm -hmm. what hey time guys, stamping guys, I, i'm just checking really quick are you getting any background audio on my end because my dad's tv in the other room is really loud and i don't think i can't hear anything I okay, I'm just checking. It, it, I'm, I'm just paranoid. So, okay. Right, well, Never Sandy, mind. Forget uh, I said Barry, Barry's running out right now. He's right on the outside of the house where we're at. Oh, right what's what's the, the, the time mark, though? I get like, 1436. Um, oh, uh, really? Yeah. Yeah, that's 1442 right now for me. 43. Yeah, I might, be a, few, I might be a few seconds off, but I mean, I'm, I'm about roughly yeah. the same place. Yes. Well, at any rate, here's the introduction to Roy right here. Yes. Um, I've got to say, one of the weak points in the film, I really don't like the sun. I'm, oh, no, I'm Tiki, here's the thing. My, I'm, I'm sorry, Gabby, by all means, go on. No, I was just going to say I'm not a big fan of him either, just to be I, blunt. I, I, I just don't think the kid actor is that good. He's uh, not. I think he has a, dir a dorpy haircut. He just he gets, <laughs> like, I want to punch him in the face a little bit. <laughs> Tiki, you're absolutely right, but here's the thing. On the rewatch, this kind of struck me, because okay. I actually I hated this kid, too. But here's what struck okay. me. Uh, I, I think it's intentional. I think you're supposed to hate this kid. Because basically the idea is that Roy yeah. giving up on his family is not a bad thing. Exactly. Right? That's the thing. That and that's why certain choices with this family are made the way because the first watch I didn't get that. I just thought it was, you know, like you know, first kind of Like, thing. gee, this family's unpleasant. <laughs> yeah, because initially they just thought, yeah, I just don't really get this. But then yeah, if it's it's giving him a non you know a reason for the whole not to stay of this film, the whole transformation of Roy's character is that he turns in he turns from a guy who's just sort of going through a most through the motions and kind of has this shit family life to a guy who yeah. has something to live for and have something to believe in. Yes, and the Spielberg goes into this, and especially at the end, uh, this these choices with the family, like this again, these are unconventional choices for the time. They're representative of kind of the filmmaker Spielberg was in the seventies versus the one he is now. And again, a classic example of Spielberg daddy issues. Oh yeah. Well, his haircut is also horrible, though, because this was 1977, so I mean... <laughs> okay, yeah, but... I, I will say this, out of all the kids, I, I hated the boy the most, I hated the oldest boy the most, he just seems stupid. Yeah, like, I don't really look at look at the me. middle child for a second here. He's literally just destroying <laughs> this doll. <It's>, now... <laughs> are we all... By the way, this whole scene is... from. It wasn't in the theatrical. Oh, okay, okay. I Honestly, I gotta tell you, just because I... The, I I'm more familiar with the theatrical is that uh, the 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 introduction to Roy was a lot better than the theatrical. I got to be honest. Really, it was really cool. We start off with the train crashing. That was really representative, of, like you know Roy's family life, and, that, and then we kind of saw he was like playing like a jovial kid, and his train wrecked. Uh huh. Uh huh. To me, that was, that was a really good introduction. I'm surprised that it didn't make it in here. So again, we, they kind of combine stuff from the theatrical I mean, and the. Uh, I the think this stuff. works in its in Special. a different sort of way because, like you said, it sort of illustrates. Sort of like you know, like the like the kid being a brat, the other kid sort of just you know like being a jerk. Uh, the daughter is honestly the only one I don't have a problem I was with. Just say, the little <laughs> daughter is like she's a sweetheart. She's yeah, just, she's fine. Yeah, she's, fine. she's got yeah. the cute hat later on with the eye holes. Right, right. Um, I I love how how this guy's like a, a model maker. Mm -hmm, I love that. Mm -hmm. I know, yeah, and I, that's why I was so really enamored with that. It was like a really cool visual intro to the guy and told you it everything is, you need to is, know about yeah. him. But now it's just kind of like we beat to know the family a little bit more in this version. Which I mean, I it, I, it think the same. I think that's why it's in here. Greg. Yeah, and, and we do get to see the model making it work relatively early on in the scene. Like True. you know, we still get all that stuff. So we do. Right. I, I will say this though. I uh, love the kids cheering at the power coming out. <laughs> uh, I, I will say this though. One of the res reservations I still have with with the film. I mean, I'm, I think I'm better on it with a rewatch, but it's, I'm still kind of questioning. But given this kind of this some the added family stuff here, I don't know if this would have fixed. I just would have liked to get to know. I would have I would have liked to get to know Roy a little bit to know what he was like before you know this occurrence happens. But I don't know how much of that's just kind of pipe dream. Like would have really changed anything. Um, that's, that's, I don't think it would have changed much because I think yeah. the whole idea with Roy is that he is sort of just like a you know just kind of an average kind of boring guy. Yeah, I mean, with a little that, fed up with his family, you know what I well, mean? I mean it, That's I the mean, thing, he, yeah. He's, he's into, like, model making and model trains and stuff. He can't be that average. Yeah, but I'm just saying, I guess more what I'm trying to say is, that, like, what we do get of him is maybe he's a guy who's sort of, like, 
stuck within the confines of his, of his own life and he wants more out of life like like for example with the whole pinocchio thing you know like his whole family like wants to go golfing and he wants to see pinocchio you know it's like well, I, uh, um, yeah i was gonna say that the reason for pinocchio in this movie is that that was yet another like inspiration for the thing once when you wish upon a star just that song was kind of what inspired the uh you know the da, 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 da. Oh, okay okay and that's why i they, honestly they, always thought it was simon Believe it or not, they actually they they got the rights from Disney back and they did use it, but they decided not to. Oh wow, I, I'm kind so, of glad they didn't use it. Yeah, but again, they still worked it into like a little uh, little wind up, uh, little wind up. Uh, they did, figure. they did. Yeah, so that's, that's, that was kind of a neat way it worked. And basically, the especially towards the end, the Williams music gets a little bit gets you hear like a, a twinge of when you wish upon a star in the Williams music at the very end. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Where this is great, <laughs> it calls him a turkey. It's very. <laughs> Uh, now, here's the thing I always give this one credit for. It's just the, visually, it's it's so dazzling. You know, it's oh like yeah! All, oh yeah! All these Absolutely. shots. Are, one of those, I, it's, it's hard to say because again, there's so many great Spielberg films. This might be one of the. I best mean, I shots think the very, I think like the last twenty minutes of the film is just like visual, just like just eye candy. You know That's what I thing. mean? It might be the best shot of Spielberg film. I don't know. I'm gonna reserve uh-huh. judgment on it, but I, it's really hard to refute. And here we go. Oh, such a such a classic shot. Oh my god. I tell you, this wow. is, uh, this wow. is right here. Of course, we think it's uh, headlights until it rises up. <laughs> After oh, we just had the so turkey cool. thing with the other guy, it's the way it raises oh. up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is great. Now, this scene is just fantastic. The way they do this coming up, like uh, I, I like the idea of just kind of these... You know the interference that comes when the aliens, uh, you know, they they, they roll up uh, by and basically have like uh, you know, gravitational and kind of electromagnetic, uh, you know, electrical issues going on mm-hmm. here. And what they do is the way they shot this is that uh, Dreyfus is 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 strapped into the car and they put on a gimbal, so they're turning the car. At least they're turning the inside of the setter. I'm not sure if it's in the entire car or not. They basically they're flipping it up, so everything's going to one side. Nice, nice. You're kind of like the you know the Inception hole in a way, but you're oh my god. Going, all the way around. Oh, sure, sure. And this again, this is just fantastic. I love how they use light in this film. That's another. That's a bit. That's a big ear, Marcus Spielberg, and maybe Star Wars. Right. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Oh, and the flashlight the right now. I'm trying to figure out like how just how hot this. That looks creepy. This 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 uh, the train stop. Uh, obviously, that, uh, this scene. J. Good old J. J. Abrams, our good old friend. Uh, he took a lot of inspiration from this scene with. Uh, the train sequence in Super 8, if any of you guys have seen that. I like how it gives a creepy feeling. Like, it does. It's kind of just that eerie kind of like, ugh. Like, what's going on? What's happening? Yeah, exactly. it's, just, it's just seeing, like, the mailboxes and the train stop. It's, like, moving unnaturally like that. It looks... Mm-hmm. Uh, I get I such a... I see Dickinson is. I'm sorry, I, I see that mailbox, and it's like, who's C. Dickinson, you know? <laughs> Sounds so retarded, but it's and then Dickinson's sister, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> and then just as soon as it started, it was over. He had, and of course, we see quite literally a close encounter. Yep, yep. Oh my god, that honestly, that might be one of my favorite scenes in the film. Just that one right there is the it, I it, mean, it's, it's pure it's Spielberg right? magic, man, from the way that the shot initially is composed with the headlights to uh. You know, to the lighting and everything, the searchlights. It's oh, well, it's, this is what sells it for me. This is why I think it's my favorite. I love this aftermath here where he uh-huh. scares him, flashlight, and then everything coming back on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, right. <laughs> just, that's just uh, really, really funny. Um, but you know, it's kind of weird. I got, I, I know it sounds kind of strange. I get kind of an Iron Giant vibe from the scene, especially with no, the I, I, I like do this. too. I can see that. I can see that. It just feels really cool. This it it just feels like yeah yeah just, again because it, it is it's Spielbergian. That's what, uh-huh. what it feels like. It's, it's cool. <laughs> Obviously, yes. And yes. the best thing with the light that we that I think that makes the light stand as is there's there's somehow darkness within the light with like fog and stuff. So that's kind of the cool effect of light. Right, you right. You can't see anything <laughs> even though it's the most because it's so glaring and so bright. It's like that's what's intimidating about. It. Usually we see things through light. Usually there should be no fear. There's no you know, it's just there's there's all nothing but clarity, but no, there's darkness within the clarity and the smoke and everything. That's what's intimidating. It's it's clever. That's a really good way to put it, Dragon. Yeah. If I had to summarize the world, the the film with one word, be clever. That's the thing I'm probably be saying most about this thing. But uh, um, but to answer Sandy's question later on, there is a scene with all these lights. You're right. It does get really hot in there. There's one scene where it got really really hot with uh with the <laughs> one with uh with uh, Julian's character. Mm-hmm. By the way, of course, Melinda Dillon, the uh, Mrs. Miss uh, Miss Parker from uh, Christmas Story, Ralphie's mom. 
Yeah, right, right. Famous <laughs> role. <laughs> oh, that's an awesome shadow. Oh, yeah. It's a beauty. Now, now this is added too by the shadow here. That's mm -hmm. that's added for. Uh, I forget if it was in the special. I'm sorry. It's going to be hard to talk about this film and not be like, "Oh, that's such a good shot." <laughs> Okay, I really like the music cue that comes up here. It's yeah. so urgent. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's why I was saying it's like honestly, I really do enjoy just the the music throughout the mm -hmm. film. I don't mm -hmm. see that there's a problem with it. I think that it really actually works. I with uh, I'm with you. I'm with you, Gabby. I'm right there with you. I like. I don't. As I said, I don't think it's a. It's as iconic as something like E. T. But right. But, but I, I think it flows very well. This scene I, is, know, I think, is I, always. I, I think it flows too. I just say. I don't know. When I think of John Williams, I think of you know like E.T. or Star Wars, and like kind of, my expectations are set really high. All right. So this music right. is really great. It's just you know. Well, at the same time, though, I still take it as you know it just it goes well with the movie. So even though it's not as quote unquote iconic, it still goes well with the film. Of course, of course, I agree. Okay, I agree. Well, what are these morons just watching this kid in the yeah, road? This Dude. Those, I gotta tell you, the, the Bigfoot guy, especially the one who's the one who's whistling, he creeps me out so much. This scene creeps me out so much. It's like uh, whistling as this kid's walking by. I hear you. Yeah, I hear you. In it's darkness, that to me. Just, every else, time I watch, it's so really creepy. Something else about the the film and the music, though, wasn't the music made before the film, and then Steven Spielberg actually added it in and edited where he needed it to be. Dragon, do you well, know anything about that? I or? know they had it figured out, like, and they basically they had it figured out early on. I don't know how early on though, so I think that's somewhat correct. Mm -hmm. I thought so because I thought because again the music cool. is a very pivotal part of the third act. And oh, the third act was figured out. The way Spielberg crafted, they, he figured out the ending first, kind of like the Andrew Stanton model. You know, he figured out the ending and then he went back uh, to figure the rest. Is most likely for that scene, he needed the music, so probably he had it from the very beginning then. Yeah, I think he, what he did was he created the score before the film was edited. Or at the and very then least, Spielberg, maybe, at the very least, maybe the iconic piece of music that's it that's used right. at the end. Well, I think Spielberg edited the film to match the music. I could see that. I could see that. Oh, so by the way, and this was a thing uh, Ken Spielberg spoke to. I gotta admit, is again, it's just uh, sorry, super clever. It is. It's a. Uh, the idea is like you'll see what the designs of the spaceships. A lot of them are modeled uh -huh. after Earth-like kind of imagery. Like one of them has like a, um, I forget if it's past thirty one, just when they all went through, but uh, it has like kind of the golden arches from McDonald's built into it. Hence the McDonald's sign. Really? So oh yeah, my God. basically, if the way it moves, like it makes like an illusion of like two arches uh, next to each other when when it moves, and they have like you know Texaco or like you know, some other gas company. Okay, like, I'm gonna look for that as they go through here. Like an Exxon sign, like they have Earth like, and there's a truck later on. Like they all have like Earth like designs built into the ships. Not every ship, but like a majority of the ships kind of like uh -huh. the show. Like the the aliens have been studying the Earth. So yeah, we're about uh, we're about a half hour into the film, a little less than a half hour, and like we're getting the aliens now. You know what I mean? Like we're getting the inciting incident. Uh, the I encounters. Think the, yeah, yeah, exactly. Like I, I, I think the film is very briskly paced. See, and I think the score here is even better because now it's like all of a sudden it's more intense. This oh is really God. dark. These policemen just. Just driving off the side of the road. Let's see. The theatrical, the guy survives. So let's see. I don't think in yeah, the yeah, he's... Cut, they, they No, they just showed he landed. That means he's okay. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> they landed all in four wheels. There's like a road below him, so he's safe regardless. I guess right, it's... right. Maybe the special edition killed him off. I don't know. Like maybe that's if he was killed. And that's the cool thing. The reason this is really cool. So the, uh, one of the reasons one of the various scripts uh, didn't work and Spielberg kind of kept going to different writers is originally the Roy character was a uniform guy. Like at one one version he was a cop and one version he was a military guy. And Spielberg, as we see with the uh, kind of the Watergate esque kind of stuff here with the conspiracy stuff, you don't trust government guys in suits. And the purpose of this scene is okay. We have someone who's going to be, you know, cred like someone who'd be credible in court if they were brought in, like you know, cops along there to kind of witness this with Roy. So Roy's just not like a lone crazy man. So okay, other gotcha. credible gotcha. witnesses are seeing him, but just it's kind of interesting given like all the permutations of, mm. of of Roy. And that's why he has kind of a not a blue collar job. He has a very simple, you know, he's a very everyman job. His computer. Well, he is character. definitely an everyman character at the outset of this story for sure. And speaking of the father stuff, that you, of course, this the, the, the daddy issue, Spielberg, they always kind oh, of Spielberg infused the film. There, daddy issues. There's more of that later on, but something the point is that Spielberg's father in real life uh, was, he was a, he was a, he was a computer guy. Uh-huh. And uh, that's, um, 
of course, just that kind of connects to what the Roy is here. So, of course, a little bit of symbolism there. Nothing's wrong. Half of my face is red. <laughs> I'm sure it's burning. <laughs> Nothing's wrong. Now, I, because we're talking over, I might have I might have missed this. If there's any difference here, but um, with Terry Gar, of course, I love we, Dick and I, of course, we love Terry Gar from from Young Frankenstein. But you know, great powerful uh, Terry Gar. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, as, as Ronnie here, but uh, as she is uh, in this movie, she, again, she's she's making intentional choices to be irritating. Like she's she's almost kind of like a Skylar White esque. That's the, yes, yes, and and that's and that's the thing that she's she made deliberate like spirit kind of gave her most Walt. <laughs> oh God! But uh, <laughs> gave her deliberate choices. Like she asked, like in the scene coming up, she's the one who's going to pick apart. Like you know, what kind of ice cream? Like he he instructed her give give her like those kinds of choices. Like you know, like really pick apart like, the unimportant details. Like they get under his skin almost. Like again, they make the decision to leave easier by making the family more unlikable or irritating. Yeah, um, definitely, definitely. Yeah, and it's all about making that ending satisfying because I mean the ending really is a powerful moment. You know what I mean? And we can't go into that ending thinking that he's not doing the right thing. Yeah, like right here, like here's where she's asking kind of the irritating questions. It was like, you know, like picking for the wrong details. <laughs> <laughs> flavor? Like a taco? <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I just love watching these films and going through like with their choice of like costume design for the movie. And a lot of times it just, they don't make any sense. I mean, <laughs> in the beginning of the movie, Lady was freaking wearing a, a shirt and a pair of jean shorts to bed. I'm just, some of these things that they really put into detail, I'm like, w but why? What does this have to do it with anything? It was the anything? 70s. It was the 70s, Gabby. It was a different exactly. time. Exactly. It was 77. You're not supposed to understand what it meant. Now, now here, here's something with, uh, with with Ronnie here. Just again, you kind of see kind of the fault and basically what Spielberg's going for with the whole unsym unsympathetic family is that she is uh, she's making it. She's making this thing about him. She's not really worried. She's not really like hearing him out. She's basically making it about herself. Hey, remember we were young and romantic. Yeah, she's trying yeah. Trying to distract right. him with with her thing versus like get, it, giving him time of day for his thing. Exactly, exactly. And of course, this whole scene where you know she got everyone out here—that was that was the origin of the film. That's Spielberg, you know, his father. Of course, of course. Media share. Yeah. Okay, so I really like this back and forth we have between the government stuff and the family stuff. I think as as we kind of you know, it, it definitely sets a momentum for the rest of the film moving forward. I think. And this uh, Scooby Desert thing, this was added. This uh, you know, in both. Like this was an added thing because they, they wanted to do this, but they didn't have the money for it back then. The theatrical version had this kind of the ship in the desert thing. Mm -hmm. This is a great reveal too. It's very classic Spielberg, you know, like oh the government's coming, the government's coming. Uh, how do they? How do they? How does this ship end up in the middle of? Do you, do you mean literally how or how did they how did they shoot this? No, no, how, how the ship, the big, this big ship that's electromagnets. Well, it's the That's idea. Kind of well, what I guess it's too. how they got the planes. I guess when the you know, when they're flying over the Bermuda, you know, Bermuda Triangle, basically they kind of maybe some create some sort of portal and it lands there. Mm -hmm. Maybe. I thought the planes had just uh, just landed there, and then the people got abducted. Maybe. Well, that that that's fair too. Again, it's a little vague. So I mean, I just I, I, I just based on the ship, I can only I can only assume that it's like they kind of teleported somehow and they just kind of like landed. You know, kind of Titanic side up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I gotta say, this scene is quite. There's some noticeable elements of the scene. Like, yeah, this is this is added because you know we have a little bit of CG here and there with the, some of the dunes. So, wait, CG? Yeah, it had some CG dunes that they passed when the helicopters were arriving. Some of that was. Ah, I don't think it's that noticeable. <laughs> well, I mean, it's. it's <laughs> I can see why they. I can see why. See why they could lose the scene and not really miss anything? Because again, we kind of got all this with the opening, you know. I mean, I agree. It's not Ooh. like like it's definitely. I don't know. I, I still think that I like the back and forth, though. Yeah, and I, I think it sets a certain pace to the movie that really works well. And the, the weird thing is that the uh, you know Lacombe isn't in this scene. I don't think he needs to be in every scene. That's fair. I'm just saying we have the the interpreter, but he's not there. It's kind of, but yeah, that's fair. But anyway. 
but as I said, I think the interpreter, his whole point is that he's the, you know, the eye of the audience when it comes to the, uh, you know, when it comes to the government scenes. Again, this is kind of a Skylar move right here, what she's doing here, where she's basically, she's cutting out the sections of paper that are going to set his UFO thing off even further. Oh, God, she's right. She's kind of intentionally trying to hurt him here. <laughs> Uh, here, I think, uh, oh no, this this bit's kind of fun. Like, again, this, this is the kind of the stuff I want to see a little bit more of, I guess. But again, we kind of have enough of it as is. It's just like a little kind of slice of life with Roy, just kind of the kids getting the yeah, show. Yeah, yeah, it's fun. It's fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, the toothpaste gag's really fun. Of course, it leads to the shaving. Pretty fun. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's a Dreyfus charm right there. It's just him you know, <laughs> laughing it off after he is over the top and she's just kind of killing the fun right there. Yeah, she is. Yeah, she is. Maybe a lot of moms have to kill the fun. They have to be the bad guy. So it's kind of to just to get and then here we go. I, I love the momentum of the uh, you know, of the mountain. I love how that sort of pays off and drives its way through the film. So here, here's, a, here's a stretch of a Spielberg reference. You ready for this? Oh god, no. I don't... <laughs> Uh, shaving cream from Jurassic Park. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah, that's exactly the bar. Oh god, that's exactly where I'm going with it. Oh god, of course, of course. You know what, uh, T? I know, I know how much you love the uh, the mashed potatoes, and I'm also, I get the I, I, I think until we get, I like it better when he models it onward. I don't really, I don't really care for like kind of. Just, it seems like more crazy when he does it like this. It seems more practical when he kind of actually sculpts what the thing looks like. Because it seems like, well, if you can sculpt, you, but you're dragon, model, dragon, the whole idea. I mean, I, I, I'm honestly kind of surprised. Oh, here's, that. The, here's that dumb moment with this kid right here. Is this like, this dumb as a sack of rocks? This kid. No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, T. Please go on. I did. No, yeah, yeah. I, I think the whole point of like the sculpting dragon is, of course, uh, you know, it's supposed to be like sort of a, a tele, you know, like kind of a psychic thing. You know what I mean? Where it's like he sees the mountain in his head and he's just trying to construct it and make it out and. Maybe he doesn't have the complete shape of it down just yet. Um, and he doesn't really even know why he's drawn to make the shape to begin with. Hmm. That's that's fair. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll I, can, I can buy them. So part of me is just still kind of curious, like, why we can't just have one example of that and so, like, various. But they, I, I, I get Well, it. as I'm I just, said, I think it's just kind of the build of the movie. It's the pace that the movie sets for itself. Okay, I, 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 could see, I, could, I see your point. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I'm saying it's like feeling like a model maker is going to like he's he'll make a model at the start. It sounds a lot, you know, logical. Okay, I have this idea. But like I said, Dragon, yeah, like I said, yeah. it's it's not even like he doesn't even realize why he's compelled by the shape to begin with. He doesn't know right. what exactly is drawing him to it. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. So he kind of has to go through that process. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, this, this is the moment I was thinking of with the kid. I, I jumped really in. don't this like either of these kids. Yeah, he's, he's wickedly annoying. I agree. Yeah, this. Yeah. Like, I want to shave his head. That's what I want to do. <laughs> God, we're he, really harsh on this kid's He haircut. just seriously, the one on the right really pisses me off for some reason. I can't, I can't tell you why. He just seems just seems really just. He reminds me of one of those kids from F is for Family. Jerk, reminds me of one of the. I was one of the hillbilly kids from F, F is for Family. Oh, that's God. what it reminds me of. That's, oh, I think that's why I hate him. <laughs> <laughs> ah, Raiders right here. Oh, so, yeah. Definitely. Definitely. And, of course, this is where, like, the big musical thing starts to come in. Oh god, this is such a cool moment when they all it's coming up when they all point towards the sky. It's just like, yep, yep, we're dealing with something out of this world here. What are they saying exactly? I believe it's supposed to be they're sort of like singing out the uh Yeah, they're singing out the musical cues for the for the Williams song. Yeah, yeah. Da 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 Oh, yeah, that's, sorry, that's, that's the yeah. No, you're right, Dragon. I'm pretty sure that's what it's supposed to be. Yeah, and basically that's why we can interpret it later on to the to the big crowd. You know, he had puts yeah. in the hand symbol, into the hand uh, sign language, I guess. So. Mm -hmm. Like a musical conductor, kind of like whatever the hand movements are. Whew.
I don't know, Dragon. Uh, like, I do kind of see your point with some of these scenes where I think that I think all the Roy stuff is perfect, uh, more or less. I think it has a perfect build to it, a perfect you know momentum. I think some of this is a little. Uh, it drags on just a little bit. Now, yeah, this is a great shot. I love that shot. You know where they're all pointing to the sky. Oh, yeah. that's, that's a great beat. I, I I think you could have trimmed that scene in half. I don't know. It's like, and this is getting a little nitpicky here, but I don't think that scene needed to drag on as long as it did. I kind of wish that scene would have just been the pointing to the sky. You know, I, I don't know. I don't know. Am I making sense at all? No, yeah, it didn't need to drag on. I can kind of reminds me of the claw a little Agreed. bit, though. The claw. <laughs> <laughs> I was saying when they all pointed up simultaneously, it kind of gave me a little flashback. Oh, that's what it's for. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the government stuff, like, for is, you know, like, I do think it fits well in terms of the uh, the narrative, right? Like, in the pace of the film. I think it fits, I, I think it has its place. I think the problem with the government stuff is that it's just not as interesting as the Roy stuff. It's not as personal as the Roy stuff. You know what I mean? Right. I honestly, well, it is actually the point where the storylines kind of intersect, the government and Roy. That's when I found, because the first watch just kind of had that realization, oh my god, an hour's passed, and we're still not, you know, kind of to closing. We're not halfway through the, the second act, I guess. Uh, but uh, basically, we get to a side after Roy, you know, he's trying, he's trying to get to, to, to Devil's Tower, that point onward. That's, uh, I, I, basically, when they're running away to the mountain, that point on, that, that I see some major cuts could have been made there. That, that one drags on a little long. We'll get, we'll get there. So I noticed more stuff in the second half instead of the first half. I think need to be trimmed. That might have come. Really? Because I kind of feel like when they, you know, when he gets to Devil, you know, to the mountain, that's a, that's when the movie for me really starts to pick up. Well, not that I'm saying like when he's like not when he just arrives there and he's interfering with when, when he's uh, you know with the government. I'm saying like when he's like after. Well, we'll get to it. We'll, I'll okay, to it. okay, fair trust enough. me. I got some stuff to say. All righty, all righty. So yeah, I like how this film kind of uh, you know explores the UFO the UFO culture. Right. Yeah, I, I, I like how that they're just like setting up you know like board games and things like that, just waiting for these things to come back. <laughs> I just want to say I love the globe gag. <laughs> It was just it was but it was an added scene by the way they were like Spielberg needed some more scenes just kind of came up one on the fly and they had this idea just like really rolling this globe down just kind of putting it up it's just really funny and it's giving uh it gives some nice character stuff for uh for kind of our man of many of many traits with Lachlan. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wait wait what's this about a globe now? Well I think I'm jumping ahead a little bit but you know the uh, the giant globe that, that gets rolled. And, oh you know. yes, the twenty five hundred dollar globe. Yes. <laughs> God, that tan line. <laughs> oh, I know, right? right? <laughs> <laughs> Looks like Two Face. <laughs> oh, here comes the mountain. Yup, yup. And again, Dragon, this is kind of what I'm talking about. Like, even the kid is drawn to the shape. You know what I mean? He's he's drawn to make the shape. Yes. Here, remind me what your timestamp is again. Uh, I'm at 42, 40, 4250. Me too. Okay. Okay, we all on the same page? Yes. 54, 55, 56. All right, just making sure, just making sure. <laughs> yeah, and see how they're all into it, you know what I mean? They're yeah. all just like, oh, oh. And that's a, re again, I feel like this movie, I feel like Arrival takes a lot of cues from this movie in terms of like how the, how the aliens are affecting the main character. I, I'm not going to talk too much about Arrival, of course, but. Uh, but yeah, this, this is kind of the playbook for Arrival in the grand scheme. Definitely, definitely. Here they come. <laughs> yeah. Oh, sorry, I just want to hit one of the John Williams uh, scores for Forget Back. Of course, so uh, many John Williams scores with this one has, it was that there's this wonderful build to once the music is kind of going into his regular theme, it somehow, especially in the very end, of course, we build past, like when you think we've hit the ceiling on the score, like it bursts through the ceiling and it bursts through the clouds, it just keeps going up and up. <laughs> right, right, totally. Thing. And the UFO culture again is kind of it's where the film start before the water gates stuff happens. So mm -hmm. it's kind of neat to see it all come together. 
And this is a dick move by the government, I think. Yes, it is. And it's kind of, it's quite dangerous, to be honest. It is, it is, yeah. You know, they're trying to cover their tracks a little bit, too, by trying to, like, kind of cast some dispersions on what they thought they saw. Oh, yeah, what course, it reminds yeah. me of. Uh, it reminds me of the moment in Jurassic Park where Hammond lands his helicopter down right over the uh, dig site. Oh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> you're right. It is a little bit like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I love how misleading the music is here too. When we... Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's kind of like a, it, it's kind of like John Williams trolling us. <laughs> that, cre that, that creepy Bigfoot guy again. Yep, yep. Oh, we have a little bit. You know, I could be stretching this, but it's a little bit of a, uh, the the way the uh, the flashlights are coming amongst the dust. It looks a little bit like kind of the the ET trucks kind of pulling up in the in the forest. Yeah, I could see that. Could yeah, see like that. the yeah. Like the government yeah. arrives there. It has like kind of a similar thing. You know, like you have like the searchlights going and all this all this dust flying up. Right. So I guess with this, you know, now the government stuff is kind of starting to get leaked into Roy's story a little bit more. Like they're directly dealing with you know, with stuff going on on, you know, in Roy's story. So that's, you know, it, it slowly ties itself together. Right. So Dragon, Simon had nothing to do with this music. Well, uh, well, again, I just, I know, People are always listening to Once Upon a uh, Star is thing. I, 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 amazing in the making of it, they never really mentioned Simon, so that might just be something we kind of retroactively kind of kind of molded into it. But I, I, I could be wrong. I don't. I don't because I mean, we all, obviously, we, obviously, it calls to mind Simon and the law. That's the thing. It might have been the origin of Simon though, because wasn't Simon in the eighties or was that the seventies? I oh, I don't know. I so if Simon was in the eighties, then this created Simon. Right. Right. Just the yeah. whole like, I mean, it sounds a lot like Simon. I, of course, that's that's it. Yeah, that's the thing. So this might have been the origin of Simon, quite possibly. If you get a uh -huh. date on that, then we'll know, I guess. But, uh, Who's Simon? You know, the game. Simon. You know, you hit the color when it pops up in the sound. You know, you do do do. It's four it's four color buttons: red, green, uh, blue, and yellow. Yeah, red, green, Maybe? and yellow. Yeah. yeah. I guess I just don't look that much into it. <laughs> Which, by the way, Simon is in the uh, the Guardians Galaxy Mission Breakout the gift shop. So I encourage everyone to, to buy their Simon today. Simon says you want. We'll do. Time. We'll do. I'll go to go to the gift shop and buy Simon. Yeah, Guardians of the Galaxy. Okay, that just sounds horrible. Okay. <laughs> what does? We'll go to the gift shop and buy Simon. That's what he wanted me to do, though. Well, what's wrong? What's wrong with the gift Dragon, shop? And it came out in 1978. Seven, well, oh, that was what was a year after this came out, so yeah. that's tech. I don't know. It's, okay, it's, you really jumped ahead, Dragon, but here's the globe you were. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, was, I just wanted to make sure I got it. <laughs> yeah, here's yeah. the globe gag. This is funny. <laughs> Wait, this is a gag. Yeah, this is. Uh, well, this it's, is like just a, kind of, it's just funny, like the lengths that they're going to. Like somebody get me a globe. <laughs> send like one of them to gripe and like that's a really expensive glue. What are you doing? Because <laughs> no one has a. It is kind of silly. None of them have a map. It's just kind of like a silly bit of like office humor in the middle of the sci-fi espionage. You and know what I mean? That's something we got to give Spielberg props for. He doesn't really. He always he doesn't show the government straightforwardly. He just he adds like a different. He 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 shows them in a different light because we've had you know Keys was a sympathetic government figure. Sure, sure, and and you know, here, of course, uh, the you know, uh, Lacombe, he's a very also a very sympathetic version. We're seeing kind of some levity with the government, but we're still t showing them as somewhat of a of an ominous, questionable force. Of course, ET shows them kind of like stormtroopers in many places. Definitely, definitely. And again, like this is cool to again seeing Lacombe on the outside of this here, and him uh -huh. focused on the music while they're all focused on. No, oh, no, the location's here. <laughs> Uh, great transition to the xylophone. Yes. But again, this is what I'm talking about, the uh, the psychic element to the alien <laughs> stuff. I think this film shows that off so well. And speaking of just uh, the editing, uh, the, one of, uh, well, no, the Spielberg trade, of course, he loves working with Michael Kahn, and Michael Kahn worked with him. This might have been, this is he the first time he's worked with Michael Kahn or one of the early times he's worked with Michael Kahn as editor? Uh-huh. 
Really clever transition. <laughs> this goes without saying, which man, every shot in this is just beautiful. I know. I love the close-ups. Like I know they had the close-ups of the xylophones and then the the, the fingers on the globe. I love those things. Close-ups are my favorite too. I sure. I really enjoy them more than really anything, I guess. I just I really enjoy the close-ups. It's it gives you more detail without having to give you more detail. Exactly. <laughs> Something really cool is that I like how each person affected, or like who has visions from the from the close encounter, they have their own way of of expressing, you know, like kind of the the image that's in their head. Like she draws it, and, you know, uh, uh, Roy he sculpts it because he's a sculptor, he's a model builder, he's a builder. Right, right. Man, and oh, to, by the way, I'm just sorry. gonna say I, that that farmland there. I used to live in a farm like that. Now ah. the story behind the kid here, what he's doing, what Stilberg, he had like he basically had toys that he wrapped, he gift wrapped, and off screen the way this kid's like looking all excited, he says toys, oh toys, is because he had a toy in a box, and the kid kind of got used to this. So when he unwrapped it, this is improvised. Toys, toys. That's why he's saying that. I thought it was a toy car. It was a toy car. I'm saying yeah. just they had various toys. I'm saying usually it was a toy car. I'm saying right. That, he think. like pulled out a toy car, so it's yeah, like yeah. Oh, toys. But like he unwrapped it though, so he keep him. That's why he like the right. tongues out. He's like, all super excited for. It. He's like psyched out of his mind for it. Right. And now this is definitely uh, more poltergeist. I think. Uh, I love the effects. The effects they use for the sky and everything. It's just. It's and this is the scene yeah, where the thing. set got really really hot. Oh yeah, I could totally see when that. When they get on the inside here, when it really ramps up to the to the, the climax, that's when it's like the, the peak uh, warmth. Mm -hmm. And Spielberg, being kind of the the sometimes jovial prankster that he is, especially because he had sisters and he liked to prank them. Uh, again, I think it's just for the effort of the of the direction here. But uh, at least the way the kid tells it, growing up, uh, it sounds like uh, she didn't know a lot of the scares that were coming in the scene. But the kid knew. That's why the kid wasn't freaking out. So she, that's oh, why that's I, awesome. A that's lot of that's why the kid. That's how uh, Carrie, uh, the, the actor Carrie, uh, tells it all growing up. So he. Like he kind of recognized as a kid, like, she doesn't know what's going on here. <laughs> of course, here's the money shot coming up. Well, it's, you know, we're on it right you now, like the keyhole. Oh, yeah. That's Wait, where, well, what time stamp are you at? I just passed the keyhole. Yeah, I just passed it, too. Right, 5146. Sure. Yeah, that's some little yeah. cup sites, man. Sorry. It's, uh... Oh, these commentaries. Oh, God. <laughs> Well, it's not too bad. It's just a few seconds. No, it's just like it's just like for Spielberg stuff. Like it's kind of important to know the you know to be on the same page with the important moments. Are we on the fireplace. Yes, yes. I'm yep. on the fireplace. All right, we're all. I think we're. I think okay. we're all fixed now. Yeah. Really intimidating. You're right. Very poltergeist uh, as stuff. Again, it's amazing that Spielberg didn't direct poltergeist. Boom. Aww. I feel like Spielberg had a big hand in Poltergeist, though. Like he had to, like much more than his usual producing credits would imply. If there was a lot of uh, production issues on that film, if I remember. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. Like I wouldn't be surprised if Spielberg ghost directed some of Poltergeist. Oh God, ghost Someone I'm not, I'm not intending that. As <laughs> yes, and it's uh, it's uh, chances, chances are. are... <laughs> Sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> is that the movie or is that you, Gabby? Both of us. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> no, silly I know oh, the, I like all the words. That close up of the, of the screw coming out. It's, I it's just that. like Spielberg can make the most mundane things intimidating. Honestly, it's a little Stephen King esque with like the screws and the small bits like that. Yeah, I hear you. I hear you. Oh, but uh, just so I can, uh, with Gabby's point, which uh, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling her on, is that, uh, yeah, chances are it's such a perfect song choice, because one, it's like chances are in terms of, like, you, chances are you never imagine you have, like, an alien encounter like this, or chances are you, every parent's worst nightmare, they never imagine this happening to their kid, because of the scene where you stay, of course. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah, I'm just saying, perfect song choice is so creepy, and at the same time, just so, like, it's, like, such a well-constructed, this is such a well-directed scene, and best director And it's possibly. Johnny Mathis, so... <laughs> 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 this part always creeps me out. Yes, it's, it's the phone and she has like the Simon esque, you know, the music. <laughs> That's the most Simon esque it sounds, to be honest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
It like, sounds, sounds like the way they shot this, if Simon wasn't... So, yeah, as I said, I mean, it, it, I'm kind of repeating myself here, but this shit is, like, straight out of Poltergeist. Oh, my gosh. Like, the it's, lights, the stuff shaking around, you know, it's just, it's all Poltergeist. And, and based on the warm lighting here, that's when it was at its most, like, the set was, like, boiling. I can see that, and They yeah, only did yeah. one shit. They, they kept this to a minimum. Now, you look here, when the kid crawls through the doggy door, he's being grabbed by a pair of arms, and that's the kid's mother. Oh, okay, okay. So that's like in the show they're playing tug of war. That's that's uh-huh. the kid's mother. Oh, so the God. kid would get freaked out. But, <laughs> and you know what's funny? She's on the trading card. They had a trade, you know, like you know, film promotional trading cards, like what? screenshots. You know, screenshots yeah. and little trading cards. And see, like the arm is like the doggy door shots so that you can see the arm pulling the oh, kid. God. Oh God! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That, that, right. that would kind of imply that like one of the humans that was previously abducted is now abducting him. Yes, yes. And I gotta tell you then, here's one of the issues I got with the film. I still on the real I still can't resolve. Uh I really don't there's no explanation to like what the aliens what, what they're doing with the why they're abducting people. I think they're I think the whole point of it is sharing knowledge. That's what I got out of it. Say why kidnap the kid then? The kid's not that knowledgeable. He's, he's a three. Well they want to compare the different types of, of And knowledge. also when I say sharing knowledge, I mean they want to share the knowledge with us. So the sharing, so yeah, sharing it with this little kid, he's going to grow up to a different generation and tell people about it. But he's also, but he's small, and kids' brains, they're so complex, they pick up things like that. So Yeah, yeah. yeah but at the same time, they kind of, they kind of, they're sending visions to her. You think they, they grab her instead of the kid. What if they were trying to grab her and instead only grab the kid? I think they... I'm saying they had a really successful. Or, track. or is, is <laughs> Ezra, as Ezra, Ezra suggested, as Ezra suggested, what if it was kind of like a, you know, like, they wanted diversity, so they wanted a diverse group of age, of age ranges. That, I, that, that's fair, I, I guess. Again, I like this is one time with the kind of Spielberg's take on the government. I like how they're kind of like a friendly, kind of like they're laughing at themselves a little bit. Again, there's like this like a government again you think you could trust for a moment of like it's like they're being a little light about. It. They're saying, "Hey, look, I'm not going to lie to you here. I'm not going to say we're conducting tests, but uh, just just know that you know, what we're seeing isn't real. Mm. It's like lying. It's like lying in the most honest way possible." Right, right. Yeah. And of course, just Terry Gardner, she's just so uninterested in what's going on. She's like, okay, I'm just hoping this is all just like we're here. He's going to put his mind in these and go home and just kind of live on her, <laughs> her, 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 her <laughs> unsympathetic life. Yep, yep. <laughs> and here's some definitely some Abrams esque, kind of like the glares from the, from the lights. And the oh, God, yes. Right, right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, I really like kind of the face of the government here again. Never, again, Spielberg's going on this message of never trusting guys and guys in fancy suits. Gabby, you're getting that song stuck in my head. It's already <laughs> stuck in mine, which is why I'm over it. Chances are, no, no, no. Anyway. it's better when Gabby does it. Sorry, Dragon. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. So obviously the government's really good at uh, playing mind games. Um, uh-huh. Haven't they always been in movies? Oh, right. I mean, well, right. <laughs> in real life. Yeah, but just like the whole thing is, as as Roy points out, basically until Bigfoot kind of steps in here, kind of he kind of basically plays in the government's hand kind of crushes the whole meeting just as Roy's about to get some answers or at least he's about to he's saying hey look don't don't just try to play kids by agreeing with us here then Bigfoot just and, and look at she gives a smile like yeah okay this meeting's over I won you know like she's is, she is kind of the bad guy of this movie when you think about it I feel like in a way a lot of movies the government is quote unquote the bad people like even in ET I mean yep. the whole you know, astronaut dude, as they like to put him. <laughs> He's Jason. He's, like, I, you know, I've been looking for him all my life. You know, we don't want to hurt ET, but let's hook him up into a bunch of crap. Now, th- this is a brilliant idea here. Just where you know the cosmic kidnapping, basically. Uh, one that shows the intensity of which he's having these visions. This to me I, it was more effective than the match. That's just me. The, the, I, I see absolutely every point you made about it. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I do like the pencil breaking yeah. though. That's the pencil breaking. 
the intensity very well. Yeah, that, that kind of that kind of foreshadows his break later on with the Looney Tunes. But uh, you know, you have that, and you, you know, with the with the dirt and everything, and. Um, and also, I like that he's drawing it on the paper, which kind of expounds upon the fears of, of reporting the UFO thing. Because she said, you know, she reported the UFO, and basically it's looking like she's crazy in the paper. I hear you. I hear you. Yeah, it's like kind of communicating some of the fears. Like he's just, he's like, it's like in a way, he's not only is he like kind of writing the symbol on someone else who's been affected, but he's, it's on someone else who is kind of in the same minds as him, but no one's listening to him. Mm hmm. Whereas I love this idea of the, uh, you see, especially later on, with the idea of like, the uh, the trucks and all the equipment kind of covered with like you know product placement. Yeah, you know, it's undercover, yes, like you know, buses really like and like, really uh, like Baskin that. Robbins. And as if we learn anything from Ant Man, Baskin Robbins always finds out. They always find out. They always find out. <laughs> when you're talking about Ant Man and Baskin Robbins, yes, there's a Baskin Robbins truck. Well, no, there's a well, there's a scene at Baskin Robbins and Ant Man. <laughs> Well, yeah, but I'm saying in this movie. Oh, yeah, there's, yes, there's yeah. Sorry, yeah. Hence, the, hence the Baxter Robbins yeah. correlation. Sorry. Oh, hey, I'm, jump, I'm jumping ahead a lot. I'm saying we're going to see that's what it's kind of what they're preparing for. Oh, I see. You're talking about the skies in the truck. <laughs> nice. Now, th this is such a creepy, it's such a creepy real world idea of, uh, you know, the, of the government kind of. Pre preparing the lie, just like well, they're, they're almost like putting on a terror attack, you know, also like you know, false terrorism, and then they kind of realize no nerve gas. There's an accident with nerve gas. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Just such an eerie, yeah, real world idea. <laughs> of course, we saw Devil's Towers kind of spelled out for us. There's like you know, again, more good foreshadows and payoffs, like the stuff we're gonna see. Now, here we go. There's like all the product plays, like Piggly uh, Wiggly. Piggly Wiggly. That's great. That's great. Coca Cola. The root the they always find out, Gabby. <laughs> oh <my God>. <laughs> <laughs> always. Ah, <laughs> oh, man, that pig. I always found that pig creepy. Looks like Porky Pig from the 40s. It yes. looks like a ripoff Porky Pig. <laughs> 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 Here we go. And and here we go. Here we she go. She came. That, that the youngest came up with the dead fly line, which I never was crazy about. But I say I, I recognize the cuteness and the inventiveness of like on this on the fly. They actually and also also I would not want to eat mashed potatoes that have a dead fly in. That's it. what I'm saying, man. I'm on, I'm on the side of that kid with the same dumb thump. That, that wasn't scripted. Yeah, it wasn't scripted. That's the thing. So they were trying so hard not to laugh. Yeah. And keep it together. Well, you know, there's a dead <laughs> fly in my. It's like, oh, I'm sorry. So I don't know what I, what I really like about this scene is just as like we've been building up to the sculpting, and this is just kind of like where the sculpting kind of takes on a new dimension, and where it's like, okay, like you know, this has been going on in his head, and now it's not just in his head; like it's it's staring the family right it's in on his right plate. in the face. <laughs> I wonder if they kept the really weird acting choice in the scene from theatrical here. Let's see if they it's it's on the the kid that ticks me off. There, it's, you'll see him coming up. Honestly, those uh, potatoes look really good. They do. Like I, I every got, time I've seen yeah, it, yeah. every, it just looks amazing. Like I want mashed potatoes. Gabby, <laughs> you're absolute, Gabby, you are unequivocally correct in that. <laughs> like those are like stereotypical mashed potatoes. I love how the wife here is just Ronnie. She's just, <laughs> just looking at him like, "What is wrong with you? <laughs> I, what are you doing?" I think they got. I think they got rid of the weird, the, the weird acting choice. Let's see. When he looks around, it's supposed to happen. I don't see them. They're not cutting to the. Oh, look, it should be here. It's, uh, yeah, the kid cries. If he cries, that's from. Oh, yeah, here we go. Yeah, yeah. It's just that. Uh, honestly, I think this is the reaction they should have in the scene later on. But I think they're having it a little early. Where like it's like, yeah, he's a little weird. He's kind of carving the mashed potatoes. But I think the obsession gets really bad, and that's when they should be having this kind of this, this break now. Like, the kid's crying over mashed potatoes right now. It's not really. <laughs> It's not, I'm, not, I'm not that crazy, right? It's not that upsetting. It's like, um, it's, 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 it's I, mean, I do think it is legitimately like he is watching his father have a mental breakdown. He, yeah, right I was about to him. say, he's literally watching his dad just have a, a breakdown. Yeah. And affecting the whole family. So he's basically just like into pieces. He doesn't know what's going on and what's going to happen to his dad. I see what you're saying, but again, the breakdown really hasn't happened yet. That's my issue with it. Just he hasn't no, I think part of it, but I think it's slowly cracking. Yeah. So yeah. I think he 
watching. As I said, as I said, I I think this scene is so affected because this is the first time that the brain that his mental stuff is starting to affect the family on a yeah, I mean, on a personal level. It's not no, I mean, let's, huge let's, yet, but yeah, like, I mean, let's make it like clear. Dreyfus is acting fantastic. I'm sorry, Gabby. No, you're fine. See, and the music and just goes is, so well with it. It does. It really does. It, yeah. And Dreyfus is just the end. He, he I love the way he just kind of gets broken in those scenes. I mean, he's he's acting the crap out of this movie. Mm-hmm. And here's that skull. I just love how angrily he's sculpting because again, it's like this to me is like that. The end of the mashed potato thing that I think is coming across in this scene. That that's where it's really grabbing me. It's just this whole. Yeah, it's just again. He's just he's so he's haunted by your scene, just carving in there. He's yeah, like, why, yeah. Why are you haunting me? It's, it's coming across in the scene so powerfully. No, it is. It is. It's really good. I mean, again, I'm just loving really going out here screaming. What is it? And again, you see this like all the frustration he's from this. Yeah, all that this is where the break. You know, we see the boiling point before the breakdown in the scene. If anyone's watched Lost, uh, this is very much reminds me of the John Locke character in Lost. Which is the only reason I bring it up is J.J. Abrams, who's kind of a prodigy of Spielberg. <laughs> Here's a well, no. Don't I'm compare J.J. Abrams to Spielberg. <laughs> I'm not comparing J.J. Abrams. I'm saying he's a prodigy of Spielberg. Yeah, I think this is the added. Okay, I think they added this scene. This is from the special edition. I'm pretty sure this is it. Because the shower is going on, right? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. This is it. Yeah, right, and he's just like in his own headspace. It's like he is just not okay. okay let's see how sympathetic Isn't he is. in the actual shower with his clothes on? Yes. yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, I thought so. He's like having a Samurai Jack vision right now. <laughs> yes. So, so let's see how upset she's because in the special I thought she breaks the door open, I thought. She, yeah, that's a, I think she, she pries the door open. I, yeah, think. I don't think she something breaks like, it. I was about yeah. to say it's something she like she picks it. Yeah, she picks it. Yeah, I remember she was right. really unlikable in the special edition, where she's really kind of like it's a really dark moment. So let's see if they keep that in here. See, now I find it a little bit different in the sense of I don't think she's so unlikable. I think she's honestly just going crazy with him because it's like, bro, what happened to you? What are you doing? So I mean, she is unlikable in some ways, but in other ways, you can kind of understand why she's being this way. Well, I mean, it, that is kind of like the Skylar White dilemma, right? Like, I hate to use mm-hmm. Skylar White as the comparison to this character, but uh, you know, like Skylar White, it was very much like she was understandable with why she didn't like what Walt was doing, but at the same time, it's I don't know. I, I do think she's being a little harsh here. Oh yeah, she's being harsh, but at the same uh, time, muffin top kid. <laughs> Come on, yelling, you got me. Stop yelling at your kid! Oh my this, gosh! Wow, this is. I'm again. I'm glad this isn't the theatrical version. I was getting cut. Kind of this. <laughs> is it just me, or does the mom here look like Elliot's mom from ET? Uh, I don't see. Kind of, kind of like her face, not her. I think her. it's just you. I think it. I think it's your addiction to E.T. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe. I, I, I kind of see the point of, of you again. Like, yeah, she is. I think you understand for the most part where she's coming from. Like, you know, again, mainly in the scene coming up where, he, you know, he's, he's digging everything. You understand, like, he is a danger to himself and others in that moment. You understand why she's why she's leaving. I just wish she was a little bit more like her now a little bit more earlier on. And this scene, however, is, again, this first time really kind of, uh, you know, You've seen this in context of everything else. It's, uh, well, think about uh, she's, she's, she's making. Uh, she she's dealing with a lot right now. Not to mention his his uh, slow spiral into what she thinks is insanity. Yeah, so she, think... just, everything piled up. She's just taking it out there. Then. Yeah, it just seems. I don't know. It's. I mean, I, yes, yeah, so it, it seems a little bit just with the, every. Not just hers, the family and everything in that scene. It seems really again. It just it's it's piling onto the more like the unlike of some unlikability on the family. Like, it really doesn't seem like a happy family. It doesn't seem like a Hallmark moment. <laughs> oh, no, it is not a Hallmark moment. That's what I'm saying. It just seems like, oh, yeah. I mean, again, it's like kind of, it's getting you on the side of like, again, he does something very like, unthinkable in the modern context. Like, you know, you should never leave his family like that. But of course, he, I kind of get why. It's... Can you define a Hallmark moment? Because you use that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Dragon, define a Hallmark well, uh, moment. That would be a little bit of from another world view. <laughs> just quoting Porky Pig there. Oh, I love this. Uh, I guess. Yeah. Sure. Duck Dodgers. 
It's great. Now you know you know I love this uh, use in the, the use of this in the movie. I love it because Dreyfus if Dreyfus is any Looney Tune, he is absolutely Daffy Duck. And of course, <laughs> Marvin the Martian is great symbolically as well. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yes, but. Yeah, but if he's if he's any Looney Tune, just just knowing Dreyfus in himself comedy, especially just when he goes goes off the engine, there's absolutely Daffy Duck at wit's end the way he plays this next scene. Mm -hmm. Now he's gathering the papers up now to make the thing. There's that little Pinocchio reference. Yeah. Also, hey, the Enterprise. Uh, uh, yeah, the uh, Enterprise. Yeah. <laughs> it's a good one. Um, Dragon, define Hallmark. Moment. All right. Uh, well, I guess if uh, like, trying this kind of a simple way, like, kind of like a full house ending almost, just kind of like you know, everything. It's sort of like uh, it, you know, it, 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 just it's sort of like something that has like you know a happy ending. Sort of like you know they have their they have their their moments and just kind of it, it boils to this sort of it's, it's hard to describe. You know? It's like not a like a shouting. That's really like a realistic thing. It's kind of like an idealistic. Like hey, it's uh, it's going to be okay. And we're here for you. You know, like then cue the music. Da, 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 da. <laughs> Right, right. That's sort of, I guess, like a home. Like something you put like on a card, saying, "Oh, ain't, ain't that the the cutest representation of family you ever did see?" I guess. Is that, ah, got it. That? got it. All right. right. Now, again, this, now again, Dreyfus is. It sounds. I know it sounds like a broken record, but Dreyfus is not only fantastic, but he's just he's so great in this scene. Where he's I mean, yeah, I, I think we can all acknowledge Richard Dreyfus just in general in this yeah. movie, fantastic performance, absolutely. But, to be specific, I guess it's that he's uh, not only is he it's it's a little it's funny and again it's kind of Looney Tunes kind of Daffy Duck esque funny, but at the same time there's a it's a dark reality applied to it too. Is that and again this is where he kind of ha he builds some sympathy for uh, you know for uh, Ronnie here where you know she's just like she's seeing her husband do this in broad daylight. Well, I mean, yeah, really, this very much is the breaking point for sure. I mean, this is where it's like there's no coming back from this. And and again, I think. It, I like it better than the, the really dark version. Just she leaves after that shower, after the shower that we just saw. That's originally she's left based on that, and this I think is more gives her more credence for leaving. Oh yeah, I, I think just had to break the windows. Yeah, yeah, it's just he's just he's so it's like almost like a I think he just has to get the dirt inside the house as soon as possible. I realize I just like take the weird barrel in through the front door, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I will say this: I do like the uh, the young kid in this scene, though. We're just saying, "Hey, can Help you get out. Out next?" Yeah, like, I, yeah. I, I, I get why he's just totally into it. <laughs> I know he's trying to uh, like build his thingamajig, but why can't he like do it orderly and get like a box and put the plants in a box? Well, I think because at this crazy. point, the whole it's just like it's overtaking him. You know what I mean? It's yeah, just... I was to say he's going crazy. It's like yeah. he, he has so many thoughts in his mind. He's having, at one a, he's time, having a nervous so. breakdown almost. I love when he just chucks him in the window. <laughs> yeah. And again, it's it's darkly hilarious. Now, I, I rewatching, I think I kind of hit upon a message of this scene, just fitting with the Spielberg kind of thing. The tropes we know with Spielberg is that. Look at that. I, <laughs> the kid just chucks the lobster. Chuck, 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 chuck. This is what, like the one time the kids are grabbed me in this movie. Anyway, um, let's see what was the. Uh, a message, a kind of a Spielberg trope that you really, I think, is kind of un the undercurrent of this scene is that it might be a message of divorce here because, of course, Spielberg being the product of divorce. Oh, it is very much. A lot of yeah, times, it is very much a divorce thing for sure. This seems like kind of the, the ugly side of divorce, where you know, mom and dad they kind of like basically she takes the kids and leaves and kind of leaves father there. Of course, you you love father, but at the same time, there there's obviously there's a reason for a for, for the divorce in the first place. And it's just like science, like it's a it, it you know it's a, it's a it's a painfully sad yet again. Some it's a little bit of hilarity here and there, because you know, slice of life hilarity. Mm -hmm. Sure, sure. And it seems like again, it's like kind of like the trauma of divorce a little bit in the scene, maybe. I mean, every every kid who's been through divorce remembers that one big blow up moment that kind of oh, puts yeah. the end of things. Yeah, I love this where he just he's actually offering to pay for it, but she just like, gets <laughs> like, hey, she's like, get away, that. get away. <laughs> just, no, she doesn't have a tape. Oh, yeah. A hair dryer. Yeah, sure. You're going to threaten me with a hair dryer. Yep. I dare you to pull the trigger. <laughs> or I could just say, blow me, ladies. Either way, same Oh, way. God. <laughs> He's just looking at him with such a disappointment. <laughs> Like, what are yep. you doing? I have no father. 
Honestly, if he was my son, I wouldn't want to have any son. Just saying. <laughs> Where are we going? The little girl's just waving. <laughs> did you forget a kid? Did you? One, two, three. I thought that was a four. <laughs> Here's the thing, I think they, it might have been, I don't know if it was a kid of a friend, I could have sworn that shaving cream, you know, when they, when they hit him with the paddle and stuff, there wasn't there a I think the kid, kid has a friend, yeah, yeah. Okay, I think the oldest yeah. son has a friend. So I was like, oh my gosh, you forgot a kid, there's a missing kid in this house. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 yeah, it's a, it must be a friend. You're crazy, you're not even dressed. I'm crazy. <laughs> and and here and I guess last and this thing is really... a very Breaking Bad esque scene for me in a lot of ways. We keep making the Skylar White comparison, <laughs> but this this very much reminds me of Ozzy <laughs> Mendes Dragon. Yes, uh, especially with kind of a similar type of car and a Well, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, and pulling out of the driveway very intensely. Nosy neighbors running over the kid's bike. To be honest, though, I mean, <laughs> if it were me, I would have so gotten the car with my kids, too. Like, dude, oh, you're yeah. having you to down, I, I and I need to get I, away from you. But to be fair, would you have driven with him, like, in front of the car? While he no, was of the car? course not. But at the same time, I would have driven faster so he wouldn't even get in on the car. Sure. There would have been no chance for him to jump on the car and be like, bye, bitch. <laughs> I, would like to, I would like to highlight one thing. I just like is we don't really have much occasion to talk about the family I guess going forward. But uh, with uh, I, I think just that boils into the issue between uh, between Ronnie and uh, and Roy why they might not be the best pair again. Why they, even if this didn't happen, they might be on the precipice. It was an unhappy marriage. They're probably on the precipice of of, of divorce uh, in the future. Anyways, the uh, you know because he was will, as we see in a scene later on, he's calling her. He's like he's trying to. He's making an effort to fix things, and again, like in, he, he does regret this. He wants to keep the family together, but she just again, she's never, she's not really hearing him out on these things. She's not. All, the only thing she said, I guess, in support of it was like, "Hey, you don't have, you don't have proof. Right. Wait, wait till you have, wait till you have proof." I guess that was like the only helpful thing she really said. Just they never got on the same page with each other. Like he put the effort in, she didn't. She just, yeah, you know, again, she went, she got out of there, but maybe she wouldn't have to get to the nuclear option if she hurt him out a little bit. Well, on the, this, is such, this is such a good reveal of the bottle. Oh, yeah. This thing looks so great. I was wondering what this is going to look like when he was like throwing it. He looks horrible. And the only thing I can think of is why the hell didn't he just go through the front door? Why did he jump through the kitchen window? <laughs> <laughs> just seriously. I mean. Well, t it, two things. Okay. This is a great shot with the reveal of the mountain right there. Yes. And th again, this th this shot is one of those, those great like stills that kind of boils down what the movie is. Just this man who's he's like this nice guy who just, he, just, he you know, he b builds this monument to his insanity. And while it's like in reality, it also exists. That's kind of like the, that's like great kind of trio of a shot almost. Sure. Sure. This man is just losing focus on what his world is. Like losing, losing gra every grasp on reality. But, uh, well, again, he's vindicated for it as well. With the TV. Mm -hmm. uh, also, just a little, little fun fact. When they were building this, kind of funny, you mentioned like you know, why, why you uh, go through the window and all that stuff. Uh, when they they constructed this, they made it too big. They realized they couldn't get inside the house, so what they had to do is they had to cut it up in pieces and then put it back together on the inside because they built it in full scale before they were, they were on the inside. <laughs> So again, he's making the effort. He's calling. Me, oh. He's trying to like say, "I'll do anything." Yeah, yeah. But I, I think this is kind of like the last ditch effort. At this point, you know, from this yeah. point out, he's sort of a changed guy. You know what I mean? He's a guy who he goes from a guy who doesn't have a purpose right here. He's just sort of lost in his own world. Into uh, you know, obviously, with what comes up at the TV, like that purpose is very much driven into him, which leads into the. Third it's act. Whole, it's the whole new motivation. He found this motivation. Exactly. Exactly. He, he, he's Even cut his him. earthly ties in a way. Sure. Sure. Because the rest of the movie has has been him sort of like struggling to know what to do about the uh, you know about the experience he's having and struggling to keep his family together. But his family leaving is what kind of made him, you know, sort of make that journey. Like right there, right there with the mountain. It's like okay. Yes. But look at the TV. I know, watching, right? Watching this for the first time, I remember watching that, and I was just getting so frustrated. I was like, "Will you just look at the damn TV already, please?" <laughs> I, was, I was like, just waiting and waiting. So finally, when he, you know, got to it, I'm like, "Finally, thank you." <gasps> oh, there was going to be a whole thing where the, the 
she left to go to her parents, uh, and she was going to use her, her actual parents, and they're going to put them in the movie. And basically, the idea is she went to her parents to kind of decompress and figure out where the kid is, oh. and that's where that's where she's at right now. But they kind of they, the the, I, the parents, I guess, declined to you know to, to shoot the scenes. And basically, they're kind of upper rivers. So that's why she's, she's randomly in a. And you don't know it's a different place. It's just, you know, it's... Uh -huh. Okay, that's a really, like, wow, that's an amazing model. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah, this dude tore up everyone's freaking yards just to make this shit. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> if I did that, I'd keep this thing, like, on lockdown in a basement somewhere safe. <laughs> Road trip. And this is where the John Williams music really starts to I was just about to it. say it's yeah, so, right, the music. Right. I literally started to say the music is It's like really okay, crazy. here we go. We're on an adventure now. Again, it's kind of our it's kind of our adventurous voyage music from from uh, from Jaws, but for this movie. But I think it's done I as I said, I think this music is more kind of in the classic Williams style than the Jaws music. Yeah, yeah. It's sort of like getting more to that sort of like, you know, the uh, very, very symphonic, you know, like <laughs> Sorry, I'm sorry. Go on. No, no, it, it, that's a great beat. It's just like, and I love the mystery again. Like, I, I think this film really does have a fantastic pace to it. It's like, as we get to this new location, we're just like, what the hell is going on? All these cars are driving in the opposite direction. This is madness. You know, this film just oh, has yeah. such a great way of, you know, like playing out the now, story. We're kind of, we're slowly entering the point where I have like, had problems in the movie. So here's something here. I don't, there, no evacuation would go this way. Listen, they're all like sitting. They're all sitting on top of the train. This is completely reckless. This is like ridiculous. This is like no evacuation. I didn't. I mean, I. I it's pretty clear that it's a last minute evacuation, and it's. Either, just, I'm just like, this is completely impractical. Like, no one's even like in line, right? It's like it's just all. It's all chaos. They don't know what they're. Dragon, doing. I. I think you're. I don't know. What do you guys think? I. I, Man, I this I, is a nitpick in the grand. I'm just saying this is where it starts. I'm well, yeah, it's a some, nitpick. Some yeah. I think there's a lot being said here that doesn't really need to be said. <laughs> I think it just kind of speaks for itself. Well, I mean, you know what this scene reminds it's, it's me of a, in terms of other Spielberg is it very much reminds me of War of the Worlds. Oh, yeah. Because yeah. yeah. War of the Worlds has that, it also has that same sort of desperate, like, humanity clinging to whatever hope it can get, you know? Right, and, yeah. And, like, the big mobs of people and everything. Of course, what we're seeing... What we're saying here with Julian is that you know these two when they kind of they embrace each other here, it's kind of a telegraph. And yeah, these two actually it's like kind of the, the you know dad finds someone else after the divorce sort of thing. It's like you know he's he actually belonged with someone else and he's in a wrong he's with the wrong person in life. Sure, sure. It's a good moment. Yeah, I think that kind of leads us into the third act right there. That, that's fair. I mean, these two paired up is really kind of the beginning of the third. Yeah, act. yeah, that's for sure, for sure. For sure. Let's see. I really. Oh no! I think they cut it out. Uh, yeah, it's in the theatrical cut. There, I, I think they got rid of Combat Carl. What? Combat Carl? I take you. Did you ever in the theatrical cut? Combat Carl's in the theatrical cut. Carl Weathers as an army man, dressed as an army oh. man. Okay, I thought you meant like an actual Combat Carl toy. No, no, did I mean like Carl Weathers as as Combat Carl as you're gonna get him? Oh God! <laughs> Was in the theatrical cut. Oh my God! They, because when they when he walked in the town just now in the, the evacuation, he got he got a, basically the supplies for this. He got the gas mask and, and the the. the the pet here, you know, the, the pit, mm -hmm. well, the little cage, and uh, then he bumped into her. So like, yeah, they got rid of it. Oh, it's a fun little cameo. However, having said that, I just think that it, it it just drives so so well into the scene of you know the car and everything, and just speeding along down the road. It's it, it's got such a momentum to it. You know what I mean? That yeah, I, here's that vindication moment for both of them. Oh yeah! Oh yeah! They both kind of stop and they get out and they, just kind, of, they, they kind of see yes vindication. Sweet, it's kind sweet, of like sweet, it's sweet, kind of like the experience of uh, like the experience I will have next year when I see Cinderella's castle in person for the first time at Disney World. <laughs> it's just like look that look I'll have that look on my face right there. I'll be like It'll be, be a Williams. -esque. Da, 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 it will be, man. I'm telling you. I'm telling you that moment is going to be exactly like that. <laughs> Oh, and also, also, this moment is very much reminiscent of the brontosaurus from Jurassic Park. Oh, yeah, it is. It really is. 
I mean, I'm saying just like the filming, the react, the facial reaction yeah. of the car and everything. Oh, so cool, so cool. This is just like just talking about Devil's Tower for a moment. This is a great location. Uh, it's just a great kind of iconic kind of symbol, like you know, kind of. Now that's an actual place, place, right? I believe so. Yes. Oh. Uh-huh. Okay. I forget if they build models of it for certain shots later on. I wouldn't be surprised. Why but yeah, it's like an actual existing up? location. I, that's always bothered me too, Gabby. I'm glad you mentioned that. That's very. I, I that's just, very. I, I get a tetanus shot after that. I know it's like barbed wire. Well, she does it twice, which is really. I a bad know. Idea. Look at her. She's just like, let me hold it. <laughs> once, once it's an accident. Once, like, okay, maybe I see like there's no barb on this part, but like, come on, twice. And of course, oh this, I, I like that there's an explanation. I forget if it made it in here. I, I assume it did, but it uh, did. no, I think it did. Yeah, basically the explanation is that they're trying to either, in, I guess, in case they're they're onlookers, but regardless, you know, they're kind of they're they're kind of using the sleeping gas on the on the uh, the on the livestock. Uh huh. Which is ah yeah. oh, god, it's so dark. It, it is. It is. And of course, sleeping being the, being the operative word. Yeah, gone. but still, just the imagery of it, though. Yes, you're right. That is. Of course, there's that a little bit of that ominous, like you know, how far did the government go? Did they actually employ a little bit of nerve gas? Right, right. And it kind of makes you wonder until you get that little line explaining it, just to verify. It. Yeah. Yeah. Like you're right. The, the T. This also is a little bit of Jurassic Park, just kind of the uh, the dinosaur on its side. Sure, sure. I love the build to the pigeons, you know, or the, I'm sorry, whatever bird it is, the doves, I think. I think it's, I, know, I think pigeon might be. It could but be. Yeah, yeah, it's a bird of some variety. It's the government! Run, E.T., run! Yeah, this is where we get kind of the the origin of Spielberg's kind of stormtrooper look on the... Yes, uh, yes, it's like his obsession like with the with the sketchy government people, right? And of course, it is a, it's a clever way of kind of taking the humanity out of the government by kind of obscuring them as much as you can, so only like a little face hole, in this case, even less in E.T., because mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you have the lighting and the obscure and stuff there. I like that the the Devil's Tower is in the background in the scene throughout. Yeah, I mean it's in the background through pretty much the majority of the whole third act, well, which is yeah. just, it, it makes for such a cool set piece. This is such a cool choice of kind of separating them like this, just like you know, you really taking off your game, like okay, now what's going on here? Mm-hmm. And I believe this is where our two plots meet, right? Yes, yes. This is where I finally kind of co align here. Now, here's. I honestly get into. Well, it's more after the scenes. I don't want to. I'll save it for after the scene. But this is a really good scene here between these, these two. It's like finally kind of that who are you people mm. get here. You know, with the skepticism that your general audience would have to, like, you know, Lacombe being in charge, because again, he doesn't, doesn't even speak English. Again, kind of Roy's kind of, uh, kind of expositing that. Right, right. It's like, I want to speak to the guys in charge here. <laughs> and again, there's more Dreyfus Gold here. We've hit Dreyfus Gold. Yep. That's going to be like calling them on. There's nothing wrong with the air. Is there? It's like your great conspiracy, like calling you, calling, calling Watergate out almost. <laughs> You know, we've come a long way with both these characters, you know, or, you know, I should say the pair of characters, you know, but with both these sets of people, we've come a long way, you know, like throughout the film, like, you know, like they've kind of like they like they kind of approach from uh, two different point of points of view and then they're meeting in the middle to a certain extent. This just kind of curse me. How many great movies we've gotten because of Watergate? <laughs> oh God! <laughs> I say it's true. Yeah, we got some really fantastic movies because of Lord. You're just, Winter Soldier. Yeah, I, I was about to say, Greg, and I was about to call you out. You're we have Winter Soldier. We got Close Soldier. Encounters. We have Nixon. We got like, a like, good repertoire of movies. Very much reliant on Water Games. <laughs> all right. Okay. For the attraction. All right. All right. <laughs> oh God. I got one like it in my living room. There's a great just had a contest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, right. Of course, the fact these like they, I gotta wonder if they think he actually has like a just a picture of his living room. Actually, has a model of it. <laughs> Have you recently had a closing? There's the title. They said the title. Oh my yeah. god! Now this is a this is gonna be a really dumb poll here, but uh, I gotta wonder if uh, just based on you know this the, the I cannot. The, you know how iconic this moment is. It's, you know, the whole, who are you people? I wonder if we get that SpongeBob gag from this. 
<laughs> yeah, Patrick is randomly saying a lot in the early season. Honestly, Spongebob. I wouldn't put it past Who are you people? I, I wouldn't put it past Spongebob to do that. <laughs> hey, in the good old days. Oh, God. I've heard Spongebob's gotten a little better. No, uh, that's... Uh, so much for that part, Drew. Do you watch it, Gabby? I, I mean, I used to... Well, you used to. I, well, here's I, the like, deal. Here's the deal, okay? I've seen some of SpongeBob now. I haven't seen full episodes, but the whole deal with it is just, I don't know, it's kind of heartbreaking. All right, well, let's, let's not talk about SpongeBob. I like the comp. I like how these, the, the shot's composed because we have our two, our two kind of, these guys are some they're very connected characters, and with uh, Roy in the middle, just kind of saying that he's kind of, he's coming into the fold in some way. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Now, my gripe with the movie is that he doesn't. He should honestly, after this scene, he should be in the fold. And honestly, with every, I don't get why if all these, we they they do spend time talking about. It, so I, I I gotta give him that. We have the general uh, coming up. I'm sorry, it's fantastic acting. We have this. The, honestly, this scene on where basically we see not that uh, you know uh, that Roy and uh, uh, Roy and Julian, uh, and. Uh, and like the rest, like the various uh, witnesses of the of the uh, you mm -hmm. know the photograph people that were just kind of laid out there, they're uh, you know, they're all there. I mean, if if they're already on the base, and again, as as uh, Lacombe's trying to make the the argument for it, I mean, they were compelled to come here. They were they were invited. We're just you know here to kind of see what happens. You know, we should just you know let him. He's making a case to let him let him stay. I don't get why this again. He has say in the operation anyway. Why isn't just I'm guessing it's stay. just like government safety protocols. Well, no, it's the the one guy uh, assuming he he, he had to make make. Which is kind of a big plot point where he says, uh, no, they, they were just like, what if they're just kind of, uh, you know, UFO, basically, what if they're pure, like, kind of UFO conspiracy nuts who just kind of came here to, to compromise the whole operation? What if their plans to compromise the whole operation? Mm. Well, I mean, I, I see what you're saying, Dragon, but at the same time, that does kind of add to, like, it's a con conspiracy within another conspiracy. But you, you do see my. You see my point, though, because if basically it seems like it's a really, it's a lot I of control. It, it just doesn't bother me as much as it bothers you. It's like a contrivance to get us all the mountain climbing stuff, you know. The which I mean, it's it's cool. That that's when the movie goes on long for me. Really, it's like yeah, we're climbing up this mountain an awfully long time and avoiding kind of being sleeping gassed. I don't know, guys. What do you, Ezra, Gabby, you want to weigh in on this? Because I'm kind of like I, I I don't necessarily agree with Dragon here. Ah. Uh... Break the tie, god damn it! Hey, right here, here's the scene. So this guy right here. I don't think uh, I, 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 don't, I don't think there's uh, any gas in the, in the what? Well, stuff. What? No. no it's this. <laughs> Wait, what did you just say? What? <laughs> you guys are talking about sleeping gas, right? And the well, gas no, in the air. <laughs> Technically, yes. But first, <laughs> we're talking about the pace of the film. Oh. <laughs> I, was about to say. Yeah. I, I, I don't know. Okay, the point is, this general guy here saying, "Hey, let's not let these these uh, these these you know these vision seeing you know the guys who got there on their own I like like Roy." I think the pace of the film is fine. I mean, you don't think I, any of this mountain climbing climax is necessary? Like, you think I, no, I, I like the mountain climbing? I think it adds I, to like. I like it. I mean. Is just really to be blunt with you, I think it adds to it because they're basically they're going to the extent of trying to climb up, and these you know the government is like, all right, we're going to go to the length of you know trying to make these people you know almost die so they don't figure out what the hell's going on. I think it adds to it. It makes it more dramatic. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And there's also definitely some shots, maybe just dragon. This might be a style over substance thing. But I just think there's a lot of shots. Uh, specifically, uh, I love the shot coming up. I mean, it's it's close to the end of the film, but when the uh, the mothership lands down, like like Jillian is not ready to go down there, but then the mothership like flies right over her, mm -hmm. I, like that kind of stuff. With them being on the mountain, I think works really well. Right. right. The, I, the first time around watching the film, I was just kind of like you know it was it's pretty slow, but you know there are certain things that just kept me involved with it. And on a rewatch, it's I have just I've been paying a lot more attention to just uh, the way everything is angled and the way uh, like uh, different uh, meanings and things like that within uh, the camera work and acting. Oh. 
So, I mean, the, the, the pacing, I don't have a huge problem with the pacing. I think there is certain, uh, certain places where it could go faster. I mean, I definitely don't think it's the best paced Spielberg movie. Uh, Dragon, it's not Lincoln. <laughs> well, true. I mean, that's that's kind of, not as I say, that's one of the worst case of pacing in Spielberg's career, Lincoln. Come on. That movie, that goes on forever. I, I don't have as big of a problem with Lincoln, but I definitely see your point about Lincoln. But... I mean, compared to Lincoln, it's it's a, it's a cakewalk compared to Lincoln. compared to Lincoln. This is fucking Jurassic Park. <laughs> yes, yes. And I say that because Jurassic Park is like the like um, the master class in pacing. It is. It I is. really, I honestly, it's one of my favorite movies of all oh, time. Really, me too. I mean, me too. of all time. And I, I guess I'm, I'm just gonna love the look of Truffaut again. The subtleties of Truffaut without words of dialogue. Honestly, that's where I'm really digging Truffaut's performance. You're just gonna get his look and see, like again, he's rooting for these guys. And I'm saying, if he's rooting for, them, why not just like let him in on the fold without going through all these these unnecessary shenanigans? That's what because I'm coming out. Can't because he's not authorized to. Because there's people above him. Again, that it's saying he's like the keeps asking for the man in charge. I get they're probably not telling him that, but I'm saying he's already he's the only guy who knows what's going on with these aliens. So he's dragon, he's the dragon, guy. dragon, dragon. Let it go. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> Enjoy the movie, dragon. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't mean to like. I, I don't mean to sound all like you know like. Anyways. <laughs> No, I, I, I mean, I, I don't know, Dre. Like, I'm trying to see your point of view. I just, I, I, I don't really, you know, it's just, it, it works fine to me. I'm sorry. Now I feel like, like a jerk. Tiki, don't feel too bad, please. <laughs> I don't think you said anything really bad. You just said enjoy the movie. Yeah, I know, but like, I was kind of putting this point down. I don't think Dra Dragon, are you upset? No, no. Uh, see, see, I said <laughs> <sense. laughs> the way he said that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I really like this. I really like this scene. Like you, you're you're looking at the two guys, and then all of a sudden you see these freaking military dudes go by. See, I, I actually like them climbing up. I, it just it adds I, to I it. I like the fact that they're yeah. I like the, the it adds to the atmosphere if anything else. Mm -hmm. Because like it like think about it like at first we just got the vague shape of the mountain right then we got the reveal of what the mountain actually is and then they get to the mountain and finally they are on the mountain I mean that uh, to me that's just a great pace to it like that that's Agreed. just a great yeah I like the movie you know. I get the charm of it that it's the sort of like you know they're climbing their obsession I just think it goes on really long. Look at those bell bottoms! Wow. Well, who was 77? Trust right. me, I was thinking the same thing. Even the freaking, you know, FBI guys and all the police. <laughs> uh, something else that's kind of cool is the fact that just the, um, uh, what, what the crap was it? All right, yeah, that the government is kind of, is, you know, is kind of, basically they're more threats, they're more of a threat than the alien. That's kind of what they're communicating in the scene. They're more threats than what they might, may perceive the aliens to be. Sure, sure. Basically, these guys are armed with, uh, I want to say, sleeping gas, hence the big kind of thing on top oh, of the big cannon things, yeah. I yeah. really want to climb this mountain. Like, I really want to climb this mountain. I, I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's so photogenic. It really is. I mean, but it's also, it's it's really green. I really love how it's just, it's such a green atmosphere, oh, and yeah, then you have this big block of brown in the back. We need more <laughs> flat mountains. I live it reminds me of Mount I'm Kilimanjaro in that way. Does it? Just the flat, the flat mountain top is Did, kind of. Right. I have a really dumb question about Mount Kilimanjaro. Yes. yes. Is it actually just? Is it like kind of like a pun on like Kiliman, or is there actually a guy named Kiliman? I I assume it's some sort of African name. <laughs> <laughs> like I assume it's like part of like. The African language. I don't know. Honestly, I've actually heard some doctors you, named like Keller. That there is some doctors named like Kellerman or like something. Like, like you never go to a doctor you, you, named Killerman, would you? When, when you say Kilimanjaro, it just makes me think of Kilimanjaro safaris. Exactly, it just makes me think of. <laughs> <laughs> and then there is like, there is a big mountain in Epcot, but it isn't Kilimanjaro. <laughs> Kilimanjaro's like the worst name for a doctor. You wouldn't see a guy named Kilimanjaro, would you? <laughs> What would you do for a Klondike bar? 
Would you? Would you kill a man? Name Amanda Dick. <laughs> I felt horrible for him. Oh, oh, oh I think I heard about this. Girl. Oh. I felt horrible for her. I'm like, if anyone could have a really bad name, it'd be her. <laughs> Wasn't she a doctor? No, no, she was. No, she was my teacher. Oh, oh okay. Oh, my English okay. teacher. Her name was Amanda Dick. Miss oh. Dick. Yeah, her name was Miss <laughs> Dick. What? Oh God! Oh, that's so that's, she, that's terrible. Especially with Amanda broken down. But let's listen. Amanda. Yeah. Oh God. So I really felt horrible. So she actually had us all call her Amanda, just Miss Mrs. Amanda. That was it. She, she, she's like, <laughs> not getting into it. I'm like, okay. And here's your substitute teacher, Andy Dick. TV's <laughs> Andy Dick. Oh God. <laughs> oh, God. Okay, so Spielberg. And not, yes, so yeah, uh, not pigeons. That is, that is, let's not drive Andy Dick into the Spielberg podcast. We're talking about <laughs> Spielberg, you know, the greatest filmmaker of all time, Spielberg. Yes, the modern day Hitchcock. If I was on this mountain and I saw that, that would freak me out. What? Yeah, that, that pigeon just, thing is really creepy. Just watching them just blow out all of the whatever this gas is. Just mm -hmm. and you're on a freaking mountain. I mean. Did that guy he just die? Any point. No, no, he's he's asleep, but he's gonna have like a massive headache. Oh, but no, I get it. You're on a mountain, though. Point. So what if you fall? I mean, that's it. <laughs> I with just I wouldn't trust of, it. With the spreading of the stuff, it's definitely uh, some Vietnam in imagery right there. You know, with the Agent Orange, it's definitely right. especially with all the uh, with all the helicopters. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, Dragon, do you know if uh, I'm, I'm sure it'd probably be an obscure pool, but Francis Ford Coppola maybe took some inspiration from this. Well, scene. I don't know. Of course, let's not forget uh, Spielberg for Coppola. Uh, well, that's the only reason I say, yeah, because Spielberg and Coppola and Lucas were good buddies, and Johnny and Johnny Lee, John Lee Hancock needs to make a movie about that. Oh but... uh, yes, uh, we can <laughs> see John Goodman in the movie to play uh, to play John Milius. <sighs> oh God, anyways. <laughs> Seriously, John Mill for the folks out there, John Millis looks exactly like John Goodman. Check it out. <laughs> so, uh, let's see. Um, oh, but was it, it, John Reese up, Davis for uh, for Francis Ford Coppola. Oh man, that'd be cool. Okay, anyways, it anyway. wouldn't be right, but it'd be cool. <laughs> anyways. Oh, he could pull it off, though. John I think he could pull it off. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Anyway, uh, so <laughs> we're gonna see what when we see the base, especially the base, but a lot of these scenes too. But it's like honestly, this stuff probably isn't the. A lot of the, a lot of these like shots, like right now when they're overlooking the base, this isn't the actual mountain. It's just kind of a mock up of the mountain. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. And I like the blend of model and uh, the model and the actual location shooting. So, I think it fits together really well. And right, speaking of model, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. sorry. Go ahead. So, no, 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 no. Go, 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 go. Yeah. Okay. Does this remind anyone else of the last scene in Raiders? Yes. Oh, yes. 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 Absolutely. Mountain, the the mountain, the mountain reminds me exactly of Raiders. Uh -huh. yes. uh -huh. The army, these two people up in the cliff looking down yep. at everyone. Yep. I'm with. I'm saying I had the exact same thing. But I it up. As I said, folks, as we're going through this movie, I definitely think that this is definitely a visually a template for a lot of Spielberg stuff to come. That's why this movie is such a fascinating artifact for me. Oh yeah. So uh, this this shot, this base here, start off as a model, like a huge model, of like of, of, of a giant location they wanted. So what they did was, they they. Just the, the the appeal of this being this such a giant kind of space because of course it's going to be where the you know the big landing is going to be right the, uh, you know, the, the, the ship is going to land and uh, what what they do is so this is actually this is an indoor location because if they did outdoor it'd be too much you know kind of worry about rain and stuff happening so what they do is they have like a giant it's like a giant indoor location with like a giant tarp over it and what happened was like sometimes uh, there was this really notable thing where a uh, like a like a thunderstorm or like I think it was li if lightning struck it that's what happened but the point is like there was a hole that started forming the tarp and everything went haywire. So just imagine like this, this some of these mountain shots as well as uh, just uh, that entire base just like with like a tarp over there just kind of has a hole in it just like like wind and all sorts of crap blowing everything around. Since we're getting oh. to the end of the movie, yes. uh, well, didn't it's a long ways till the end, believe me. <laughs> well, it's close. I mean, mine yeah. says we have 34 minutes left. Meteor shooter. I'm sorry, you gotta be going. Yes. No, you're fine. You're fine. Uh, Steven Spielberg was talking about how there was nothing more difficult in his life than editing the last 25 minutes of this movie. <laughs> And I don't blame him. I mean, the last the, the last twenty five minutes of this movie is is 
it's just like it's like the it's basically like the ending of E.T. But for like a whole act of a movie. Exactly. <laughs> I like crazy. I literally don't blame it for being the hardest thing. And he said it like in his life, there was nothing harder than editing the last twenty five freaking minutes of this movie. <laughs> I would not have wanted to be him in it. I'm just saying. It, I mean, because it's it's at just this, there's so like, much going point, on. At this point, folks, we're just gonna be like, oh, ah, oh, that looks so pretty. Well, let me let me say this just to undercut that a little bit. So while this does look oh so pretty, dragon, looks, really, really, well, dragon, really. Let me, <laughs> I'm not. I haven't said my thing yet. Here's the thing. It's like I agree with that 100. I literally I, don't breaking, believe you right now. I, you, like we get like a half hour's worth of just like an awesome, awesome, like cathartic finale. Go ahead, Dragon. Go ahead. I'm not saying what you think. I'm saying, saying that yes, it, it, it's real. I just wonder if uh, you guys think it goes on a little long. It looks. Uh, that's no, it. Well, I'm, it does not at, go on too long. It's perfect. <laughs> well, that's. <laughs> This film has well, me, Dragon. This film has me under I, its spell. What I'm trying to say is that <laughs> while it's... Any, I'm like, we're in a Disney debate right now. <laughs> Go ahead, Dragon. My, my point is that watching it, yes, it, it's, it's beautiful. Not any, any thought of it going on too long, it's undercut by, yeah, you know what's so darn beautiful? It just kind of undercuts that point at all. Just like it's so, it's, it's, it's like it's a painting come to life with every shot. So it just kind of undercuts the whole, whole thing. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I like the whole thing for me is that what people forget about the rest of the film is that like, like a good 75 80 percent of this film is not effect shots you know what i mean like it's all family stuff and it's all character development and it's all government stuff so i think to have this cathartic thing at the end of the movie i think it's one of spielberg's crowning achievements to tell you the truth i really do i think it plays together like a symphony yeah, i mean it's let's like, face it this scene onward is like what people remember the movie for I mean, I really do think this is like live action Fantasia right here. And yeah, yeah maybe maybe it is a little bit style over style, oh, um, Dragon, if you want to call it that. But <laughs> well, speaking of uh, speaking of Fantasia, you know that I'm sorry, there, the, the influence of the movie it was it was four things. It was Firelight. It was uh, Firelight was the meteor shower. It was When You Wish Upon Star, and it was uh, one sh one uh, one sequence from Fantasia, Night on Bold Mountain. I could definitely see the ball. Those mountain, are the four especially, things that, especially with the giant mountain in the backdrop. Yeah, exactly. Hence, I'm saying those are the four influences that that, that Spielberg like he was on inside the actor's studio, and he kind of he highlighted like kind of oh, the inspiration dude, inside the actor's studio. How good is that show? Now, speaking of that, I mean, uh, <laughs> it's right, a great show. And what James Lipton pointed out something kind of blew Spielberg's mind about this scene. So it's very relevant. Is that uh, just this whole like you know, use uh, basically music and computers. Spielberg's mother was a, was a was a concert pianist and uh, you know in music, and uh, and his father uh, worked in computers again like kind of Roy really in this movie. And basically uh, he kind of asked Spielberg right on the spot, you know, did it, did it ever occur to you during the making that it was you know it was kind of basically a representation of your mother and your father together, kind of making something very very creative, very much like Spielberg, kind of like Spielberg's birth. And Spielberg on just had like an oh my god, I didn't realize it at the time. He said yes. He said he's not that. He said I wish I could I could take credit for that, but I'm, I'm in front of all of you, I, I didn't I realize until this very moment you're absolutely right. <laughs> That's awesome. it, it is. It's like kind of therapy on stage. That was kind of Spielberg's moment, like. Oh my God! Yes, basically, this this whole scene—if you want to really boil it down, really ridiculously—but but awesomely, this is Spielberg's birth. We're seeing technically. Oh God! <laughs> it's the birth of you know, the marriage between the, oh, man. the marriage and the harmony between you know, the technology, you know, the technology and the music, mm -hmm. which is you know, kind of Williams and uh, you know Williams and kind of the the special effects, which you know, make kind of a Spielberg. Of course, of course, yeah, yeah. So. And as I said with the music, I just think it's gorgeous the way that, you know, the score just kind of is blend like that, that little xylophone thing, you know, it's just like blended itself into the fabric of the actual composition of the score at this point. Okay, this scene is very, this is maybe going to be an odd comparison, but this scene kind of reminds me of Fantasia a little bit. The way they're all sort of just shaking hands and congratulating each other. Yeah, it you know, the interludes like the in Fantasia. It reminds me of the orchestral like interludes in Fantasia. Yeah. Right. 
which it is in a lot of ways this this whole segment is like an interlude you know what i mean it's like it's it's like basically what we just saw was like the opening composition and now we're going to get the suite i'm going to reach back about uh, an hour and uh, uh, 47 minutes because this is one of the points i forgot to mention um oh, lacombe boy. Uh, interesting. When we, start, when we first see Lacombe, did he looked a lot like Spielberg? Oddly, it's kind of Spielberg we recognize because he has yeah, the gray hair yeah. and he had sunglasses, and like a scarf and a hat on, looked very much like Spielberg the, today. That's such a cool effect shot with the clouds. Oh yes, very kind of rhino esque from James and the Giant Peach. And of course, e even more Raiders here with the clouds. Yes, yes. Uh, Don't look. <laughs> Go away from the bright light. Oh my god! Just ah, oh. oh, it's it's so visually like, stimulating. Just, just watching this and just seeing how it looks so much like Raiders, I was expecting all these people, all the people down there, <laughs> the aliens to like smite them off the face of the rock. They're just like they're, they really look at the guy's eyes for non glasses or something like. Oh. <laughs> Everyone in this movie just really looked at the aliens were non-violent, right? <laughs> They have a perfect target, just like. Now, oh, let me ask you guys this: Do you think, uh, you think, had they gotten the uh, the message wrong, you think they would have been either curtains or just like this would have passed them over? I I honestly don't think these are violent aliens at all. I think they would have just passed them over, if anything. I don't yeah. trust anything. <laughs> Again, non-violent, but they still they did kidnap people against their will. <laughs> for but you know what purposes and to spread their knowledge yeah you know here's yeah. the thing i think would have fixed that for me is when when our guys come out and this is like a very small thing i think i i would have loved to see added like in a, in oh a my range, god we didn't uh -huh. is, is if one of them just said uh like you know when the when the pilots come out i would love to hear them say uh like they saved us you know the idea, like you know, they kind of like got him out. Like, I see what you're saying. Yeah, that yeah. to me at least I would have like kind of given us like a little nugget of like, okay, that's why they abducted him. You know, and now here's right. like some of those logos. Like there's a truck that just went by. I think some of these, uh, the Exxon logos in one of these. Oh, uh -huh. well, I I love how they have a bunch of different cameras taking so the same picture, so yeah, they can prove that it's all the same. That's yes. great. Yeah, they had the spy camera that one guy used, like the little, like the long, elongated one, the small one. That's like the old kind of James Bondian spy camera. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All this recording equipment too for the sound. Too right, right. And they're also again really, you know, God bless synthesizers. Otherwise, again, the, song, <laughs> the upcoming scene never would have, never would have <laughs> panned out well. <laughs> Was the recruiting basically go back and forth the way they did? They needed the synthesizer for that. <laughs> The underside of the mothership was actually inspired by the lights of the San Fernando Valley at night. Oh, wow. I know, oh. right? The weirdest things that they put into this stuff. <laughs> I, I can top that with something even weirder. Uh, <laughs> the, um, the, again, this is the word from the making of feature. I'm not, I'm not just reading into this. I swear to God. This, they, uh, the, the, let's just say it's, a, it's maternal for a reason. Uh-huh. It's uh, it's modeled after something very uh, you know, very uh, maternal and uh, and uh, let's just say bosomy. <laughs> oh, I, I kid you not. I, I I'm sw I swear to you, it's on the it's on the making of it. Uh, Is that uh, even a word? word. <laughs> I, I'm saying yeah, that's why like one part you know it's it's why I have kind of the city structure on the you know like kind of the the city as structure <laughs> pointing at the at the, the one side and that's why it's round on the other. It's, oh my gosh. It was modeled after something uh, bosomy. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so let's talk about the uh, this final moment between Roy and uh, I forget her name. I'm dumb. Jillian. Jillian. Yes, I'm sorry. You know I'm, I'm bad with names, Dragon. I know uh, you're extraordinarily bad with names. Yes. I know. I know. I okay. A. I love that moment because it's just sort of like it's it's a big final thing between them it's like yeah you know like they had each other in their lives for a certain point and then roy is going down you know like she's not ready to go down yet roy is roy's ready to take the trip it's all very symbolic of what's going to happen at the end but i love how as she's up there on the mountain not ready to get close to the aliens the biggest ship of all flies right past her. And we're going to get to that soon. Mm -hmm. I just love the payoff of that. You know, and that, that, that kind of stuff, that kind of visual storytelling, her being on the mountain, not ready to go close to the aliens, but the aliens being close to her, 
that is exactly what I am talking about in terms of like why I think them climbing around on the mountains works. Mm -hmm. It's all very quiet. Take us a while to get there. You know what? You know what? I'm kidding. All right, it's, it's fine. It's like yeah, I told you. It's always just the beauty of it undercuts Aunt Chris's with the ending. Yeah. yeah, that's all it is. That's that's my that's the point I was trying to make before, just being chopped at every every turn. Yes. Wow, that's beautiful. It's a oh, beautiful yeah. model. Yes. Yeah, this is what I'm talking about. I can't about. believe it's not. Well, that's there's probably CG in there now, isn't there? Yeah. What CGI? Oh, let's, let's see what. If no CG. I don't think there is. No, Steven no. Spielberg was actually messing around with CG for the a while, but he's like, it just seemed so unrealistic and yeah. ridiculous that he just left it out. I gotta wonder wow, if that, that pulsating light looks amazing. I, I gotta wonder if that pulsating light is added though. Which? See, uh, as the thing goes over the those are uh, goes over the mountain, it's like kind of there's like this pulsating light that was there. So I wonder if that was added or not. Oh, I, I don't know. <laughs> I, I do know that the stars were added, though. The stars aren't real. There we go. Yep. Boom. I'm in a shadow. We're just like everyone else in the movie. We're speed. It, it, seriously, this <laughs> moment gets me every time. It's just... Uh... I think, honestly, my favorite parts of this movie... Are really the dark clouds. Yeah. I just really love the effect of the clouds. Oh, by the way, uh, oh God, it's probably past already, but uh, underneath the ship, basically with that kind of that city like structure, they worked in a Star Wars Easter egg. Oh, yeah, I bet. R2D2 is underneath. Oh, underneath, God. He's, he's built into the ship, the mothership. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's probably past already, but he's uh, using one of these no, shots. Oh, wait. Maybe. Well, it's, uh, R2. it's hard to it's hard to spot because there's so yeah. much going on. Yeah, there's a lot going and on. It's just a dome, so how are you even gonna? It, yeah, it's kind of hard to figure that out. There's a freeze frame. So well, not here. <laughs> this dude's like <laughs> yeah, here. Bye. Jurassic Park. Jurassic Park. Yeah, went to a party party. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and, and look how well that ended for him. How does that thing land? There's so much coming out of it. Wow. Just, oh, God. That is the best designed spaceship ever. Oh, yeah. I don't it care is. what anyone says. And, of course, Jillian up on the rocks, like, holy crap. I know. She's like, oh, That's my God. That's a big ship. Look at their glasses. Yep. The glasses are awesome. Kind of spoiled <laughs> the tough gun look. They're government glasses. <laughs> I know. <laughs> the same glasses. We need some disconnect. What do we got in the budget? Uh, glasses? Okay, let's do that. <laughs> <laughs> they all put on the exact same pair. <laughs> I know. We buy them in bulk. Look at them all. <laughs> they are all are wearing the same glasses. <laughs> oh, I love this guy's just reaction. This is where that the Williams music is doing what I was talking about, especially when he gets on the ship. It's when it goes that that build upon build upon build. Well, at this point, it is like this is like the start of the build, right? Yeah, it's like the start, of it, and it, it keeps building throughout. But like when it, you know when we have like bigger moments happening, then it gets then it starts to really swell and build on that. Right. Right. I honestly don't like the way the aliens look in this movie. Well, you know what's, it I'll tell you what's interesting. You know, the aliens here, of course, before ET, obviously, but uh, oh. the, uh, they had three. They were coming for like kind of different races of people with aliens. They had different races. Uh, I was saying that Spielberg's team putting into account what his logic was for. Is that you know it was like they wanted to show that you know like different races and kind of another sim similarity has to humanity. So that's why you have three different. Types of alien here. Yeah, oh, I like that. I like yeah, the that. long spindly one. They initially uh, looked like I like this this move. Like if you were to delineate the three races, one initially looks scary with you know the kind of spidery look, and then you have the cute kind of kid like ones, and then you have like the friendly alien. It's kind of like this. Honestly, it's kind of a blend of what ET kind of turns into. Uh, <laughs> ET ET is horrible. Okay. So the movie e. of the character. Everyone always talks about it. The design. The whole. Thing. It's just the. I just. You know, E.T. is secretly evil, okay? Everyone just loves him, and that's what they want 
that's what he wants them to do, and no one just no one realizes. I, how Gabby, I'm kind of with you on the character, but I am not with you on the movie. <laughs> well, here's the deal: the movie's actually not that bad, but E.T. is scary as hell. Okay, there is a e. really e. dark e. joke I can make about E.T. right now, but I'm not. E.T. really is creepy, though. I mean, especially when he'd lift up his neck and scream. I'm like, come on. Well, the anim I think the animatronic use for the movie is creepy, but the CGI really isn't that bad. I mean. It's it's not that bad, but it's it's just the characters. The characters right, can we not talk about? No, no, okay, we have the we have different ETs, guys. Different ETs. So we have, yeah. uh, we have the uh, kind of the best game of Simon ever going on right now. Oh yeah! Oh yeah! <laughs> we can possibly what use general aliens? research here. This is the origin of Simon. Technically, who so good to create a game. <laughs> if aliens were real and they looked nothing like this, they would be so offended with us. <laughs> like made them look so what? horrible. Honestly, that's the movie. You know, well, we kind yeah, we kind of got that with Paul. But I want to see more of that. Like you know, like oh, that, that's so that's Paul, movie. I love this Paul's movie. lame. Paul was lame. Paul's not. Look, I'm not saying it's 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 hardly Yates, but it's you know it's okay. It's hardly Yates. <laughs> what? <laughs> Every time I use that reference, you keep forgetting it's in Saving Mr. Banks. Every time it's I sp Saving Mr. Banks, but it's still hilarious because it's just it's like so it's the most random place. <laughs> To say it, it's the most random time. It's hardly Yates. Well, I'm sorry. When you think of you, when, when you say Yates, I just think of David Yates, the director well, I, of the Harry Potter franchise. What, 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 what are you guys even talking about now? It's, <laughs> I mean, the only thing I think of is freaking, you know, Colin Farrell, dude. The poet dying. I mean, it's hardly Yates. What? Saving Mr. Anyways. Banks. There's a point where Pamela brings her father uh, up to work. Okay, he he's like, okay, "Father, look, look, I won this." You know, and he said, "Oh wow, okay." He wrote, she wrote something, Harley and he, he reads it. She she wrote a poem. He says, "Harley Yates, Yates being a famous poet, it's really really it's really high art." Okay, okay. Anyway, I'm still very very lost. Uh, right, I'll explain to you later. It's the point the point is like you put it. It's okay. That's, that's, that's the genesis of that tangent. It's, it's okay. Wow, that that tangent was all about fucking Paul. Paul does <laughs> not deserve a tangent like that. Well, you started. I just want I reference Paul, and then you you brought him up. The Fuck point is, Paul. that's what I'm saying. You're dipping all over it. <laughs> that movie was a yeah, major disappointment point. to me. Anyways, the point. Anyway, good aliens. aliens. Well, Let's look at the aliens. The is, oh, as everyone yeah, wants. I was just trying to come again if it was a big, really cool idea for for a movie. Just you know, get aliens' reaction to how it's presented in pop culture. We really do have a horrible. It's kind of like how. I love the blues there. Oh my god! It's yeah. kind of like yeah. how a lot of people depict I don't know dinosaurs, but then there's some scientists that say uh, dinosaurs didn't roar. They most likely, you know, they were more like birds or. The, you know the voice yeah, yeah. boxes, or how people depict Jesus as a white guy with brown hair when like, specifically they say he could actually be dark skinned with you know. Right, all, you, you know. guys really have to see that <laughs> Kevin Spacey movie. With Apex. <laughs> everyone, everyone, check out Capex with Kevin Spacey. There's a good alien movie for you. I've heard of it. Anyway, here we are, the moment of truth. Look at everyone's faces, though. <laughs> You know what's hilarious? They tried with this first alien. They uh, they put an orangutan in an alien costume, rolled him down roller skates. Oh my god! <laughs> Can imagine it did not go well. So they didn't do yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, that does not sound like it would go well. Uh, well, bear in mind, we're well, sorry, we're not the alien yet. But I was just jumping ahead. But this is uh -huh. the point. Not, this is part of the return. I would love if they if, if the, the soldier here. Who, by the way, TK, I don't know if you caught this. Now here's a here's a great Spielberg reference. I have to wonder if it's just coincidence. It must be a coincidence, but it's awesome. Yeah. The the, the, the <laughs> You pick uh, it's uh the the first uh, uh the first military guy that kind of walks in here. He uh, his name is Frank Taylor, and Frank Taylor was one of the aliases Frank Abagnale used in Catch Me If You Can. I, I did not. He was the pilot. I did not catch that. <laughs> so Frank just kind of. All right, all right. Dragon, you must have like some kind of superhuman mind where you pick up on the tiniest detail. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> Say Frank Taylor, it's, you know, he, it was his, it was his pilot alias in Catch Me If You Can, which is a Spielberg directed film. So, amazing coincidence because that was, you know, Catch Me If You Can based in real life. So. United yeah. States Navy. Yes. <laughs> I just the way that these people say their lines is just sounds so bad sometimes. I don't think they realized it. 
this is kind of nice. I'm checking off the list of, hey, everyone's again. For mm-hmm. over time, the girl's kind of like taping it off. Like, he's back, he's back, she's back. There's the kid. Okay. The visual here. representation of that. It's a cool oh. idea. They haven't aged the day. And again, it's what I love that, like, you know, they saved us. Or, like, they helped us out in some way. Or we, we you know, like a little one line. How have they not aged? They, well, were, the they were not in our time. Sort of the sh- yeah. But I would honestly hate that because if I had somebody that I loved or I cared about, they got old and died and I just lived, you know, it's, it's kind of like um, aliens. F- Futurama did an episode parodying this, this return, like you're not aging with uh, the whole, uh, you know, with, like, the, the, the whale of obsession. You remember that, Tiki? No, but I mean, just the whole idea of like, you know, freezing yourself and aging, you know, like coming back in the future. And I, oh, yeah, obviously sure. that's Futurama in a nutshell, but. Yeah, but I mean, like the little like, close encounters homage of the return, like in, in a, like a season, it might be like six or seven. I don't know. Oh but no, you, you I, like, I haven't, I haven't seen any of the comedy series. Oh, uh, okay, that's probably yeah, sorry. Yeah, but yeah, but, uh, but yeah regardless, I think you're on hitting upon the same thing. Yeah, it's kind of a. Uh, I've been meaning to cool go back and catch up on the new Futurama stuff. I just haven't gotten a chance. Well, it's all on Netflix. I, I, know, I, think. I, know, I, I know, I know, it's on Netflix. <laughs> I have other stuff I'm watching on Netflix. All right. All right. <laughs> Now, this to me is a really sweet scene. This is like a, this is the payoff. I just, I just wish we could have gotten there. But again, it, it feels so worth it in all this, all this great, scene, all this great stuff here. Well, great. I like how at the end of the film, it's like everyone is like all of you know, like the government and the citizens yeah. are all just kind of one. You know what I mean? They're all just having this experience together. I think there's a really good message in that. And honestly, I think my favorite truth true folk stuff is probably in this in the section is when he has that moment with Dreyfus and then he's, then he's going to uh, do his interpreter and he's kind of helping him out. It's really mm-hmm. nice. And of course now they're having their cake and eating it too, minus an orangutan. <laughs> oh, what I know is why they had Dreyfus' father do like act in the movie, but then they took all of those scenes out. I'm sorry, what? Richard Dreyfuss' father was in the movie. He actually oh. did some scenes, but at, at the end of like editing and everything, not one scene of his father is actually in the movie. Huh, that's strange. Oh yeah, well, Except, I, I, I don't know I, why. his father was in this, but I mean, I guess it's kind of a similar thing to why her parents were in the movie. Just like either, uh-huh. uh, you know, just, they want to run too long with it, maybe. Right. You learn something new every day. <laughs> And of course, this is this is obviously like, no doubt, the most ambitious movie of Spielberg's career. Absolutely, I mean, he's, he's making choices that may seem insane to some people. Sure, sure, very much so. And I do think to this day, this movie is the closest that Spielberg got to uh, to Stanley Kubrick. I mean, fuck AI. I mean, yeah, what? Yes. AI has its moments. All right, like we'll probably yeah, let's- talk about. We'll probably talk about AI on a future spiel. When we're desperate, when we're desperate for yeah. spiel movies, then we'll get the AI. But, uh, but yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'll talk about AI before I talk about something like The Color Purple or something Or 1941. Like right. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I, take, I absolutely agree with your point, though. You're right. This is, uh, uh, this is honestly, because, again, cause every, every, every shot's just... Yeah, this is the most movies. too bricky and movie of Spielberg's career, I think. Yes. Oh, yeah, he was going for the 2001 vibe, and he, he succeeded in space. Mm-hmm. Look at how ridiculous they look, though. I mean, they, they look like they're, like, dancing. Well, Spielberg's fear and the thing he tried to avoid, same thing with E.T., honestly. I mean, with Aliens and General Spielberg, I, I take it, is that he, he hates the idea of, like, of looking at, like, in, uh, looking like aliens are just people in suits. So he wanted to go for... Again, the orangutan is, makes them non-human looking, but it just, it just again... It looks like a spider. It looks like the Coraline's other mother. Yeah, they, yeah it they does. It really does. Marionette, they want the marionette look on this thing. Almost kind of like has an HG Geiger look almost. Especially I like the lens flare. Lens. The lens flare. With the, with, again, I love keeping it obscure with the light. That was just calmed. <laughs> yes, Tiki. <laughs> not a big fan of these guys here. Just, yeah, I, but I, here, it's not very creative. You I, like, I, I like the look of the no, slender no. guy. I, I don't. I agree that these guys are kind of. I don't like these, But I these think, dudes look literally just like a freaking actor put on a suit and then put a fat head on. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's literally what this looks like. Cool. So, it's just. I, I, don't, I do think the lighting helps obscure it, though. Yeah. It does, the, but at the that. same time, you can still tell this literally is either just a bunch of shorter people. Oh, no, it's or, a bunch of girls. It, 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 little, little, yeah, little girls. Or, yeah, it, 
with a bunch of, with like a, a fat head. Mm-hmm. I mean, look at that. That looks horrible. <laughs> Well, this is a cool thing with uh, with uh, uh, Julian here, which is taking the pictures coming up. But uh, mm-hmm. in addition, to that, it, I think you guys are absolutely right on many, many parts. Here. You know, I like how they kind of it's like a catch all. Like any again, it's kind of Spielberg playing the whole thing, like leaving a lot to the imagination, where it's like the lighting obscures them really a lot. So any any weakness in the look, kind of like a jaw, is like less is more almost. The the less you well, not exact. I'm saying the less the less you see, the more. The more your mind kind of adds yeah, it does, I mean, it does kind of like lead to the covers emotion. flaws and imperfections. Okay, these though, however, these shots where the camera gets closer and closer. Yeah, yeah. I like the shots. I just don't like the. I, aliens. I could be crazy here, but I think what they're going for because again, they, they are wearing masks, not just like exposed faces. Yeah, or look something at that. Here. I mean, do you see how stupid? That looks? I, I I I'm with Gabby on this. This look is like kind of like eyes. the one glaring issue with this whole finale. Yes. Tell, tell me this. <laughs> To you, uh, when when she was taking the pictures, the way that was cut, it kept going between the faces, yeah. and between the shutters of the aliens, and 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 the kid's face. Do you think they're kind of somewhat saying that, like, hey, the kid looks a little bit like the aliens, or what? Oh no, I think I think the reason why they did that is, I mean, he obviously has been with them for God knows how long. I think yeah. he's just you know examining them as she was, but I okay. think he's more used to it because you know he was taken. And this I is don't think the kid looks like that. <laughs> I was, I'm just wondering, like, why you can't, why focus on that while well, we're kind of intercutting. Maybe I like that everyone's wearing sunglasses except for uh, except for Dreyfus there, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and of course he's the one who's going to get picked out amongst amongst the rest because they see something special, and possibly because of the psychic link. That's probably another reason why Dreyfus is is, is picked here. And this were essentially it's kind of what, the, the scene coming up is what got Dreyfus the job because they needed this ending done right you need kind of the boyish look on him and they also need him to be able to cry and convey the emotions which again steve mcqueen just you know couldn't do they want to corrupt this perfect ending you got going on here and it really is a perfect ending i think it really is and Truffaut's look here is again it's all this all these just him looking back to Truffaut and then jelly and everything it's words. and i i gotta tell you initially in the first watch i was i was i was, I was kind of wondering like yeah he's just kind of and Spielberg himself has said, you know, he's always tinkering with this movie, like any filmmaker tinkering with their films at the last minute. And uh, the filmmaker he is now with with, a, with seven kids, he would never have ended it this way. But mm-hmm. back then, just being kind of the the op, you know the optimistic, like you know, yeah, what, what's out there, man? Yeah, we got to go explore things. You know, kind of the filmmaker, you know, film student Spielberg. That's uh, he he sells you on this ending on the rewatch. Absolutely, he sells you on. Yeah, you buy that this guy really he's, he's kind of cut his ties, and he's just and this is the build upon the build upon the build in the score. Oh yeah, oh yeah, very much so, very much. This is the moment that has that right there. And then he gets on. Oh god. Yeah. And I mean, it's, 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 about it's, the designs of the aliens. They're not perfect, but it's the emotion of the scene that this captures that really, really works. Yeah. And again, it's like an optimistic thing of him leaving the Earth with kind of nothing tying him down. So again, I just think sure, sure. Don't really have any sec. I, I, you're in his mindset. You don't have any second, any second thought about this grand opportunity where. If you divorce yourself from like, wait a minute, no, he would never do his family. He'd just that he'd be like, and I do like how he has someone on Earth to look back on fondly. Yes, Jillian. Exactly. But it's not something tying him down to Earth. And what they might be communicating is that you know it's like a a, a proper like not a proper like you know like the right partner with her because again she was like in this with him. It's like representative of like you know working marriage. Like she supports him. Like she's like sad to see him go and like the kids saying bye bye. All that stuff. So mm-hmm. the family. Exactly. Sure. Exactly. So he does get that family in some sense, but a supportive family still, like a family dragging him down in life. Right, right, very much so, very much so. This is nice, and this one now. Here's the influence. Now, the, the way Spielberg reflected upon this scene right here, with, you know, the alien does like the signs of, of the music. Uh huh. That uh, that uh, Truffaut was uh, laying out earlier on, which is, again, it's a nice ending. Basically, the idea was that, uh, which I don't believe it gets communicated in either version, that this guy was going to stay stay behind. Well, an idea that hits Spielberg afterwards, like, what if you did this scene and the aliens stay behind, like, as like a foreign exchange thing? They take a human, they we keep an alien, and that's where the idea yeah, for EP kind of. Don't keep an alien. Well, yeah, but you know, it's just like this where the seed kind of grew for the idea, of, like doing another alien-related film for ET, right? Right. Yeah, that's, that's kind of the origin of the idea. What if I end in close encounters a different way? Like, you know, I kind of wish I could maybe play with the idea there, and just he developed that in ET. <laughs> Oops. Of course, there's that. There's that Williams goodness. Yeah, and this uh, uh, it's still building, Dragon. It's still uh-huh. building. <laughs> it's not until the ship takes off that it reaches the climax. Haven't, haven't had this much build. build. Like, Interstellar is like 
it's kind of funny. It's kind of Interstellar kind of borrows from this with the whole build upon the build upon the build with the whole like you know the uh, the goodbye kind of theme. Uh huh. And here yeah. it comes. I think this is really the climax right here. It's this the is climax where... at three minutes left and forty seconds. Oh yeah, right here. Yes. Oh okay. Yeah, right there. Right there. Bam. It's the city. Yep. Oh my god. Oh, fucking Spielberg. Oh, God. <laughs> ah, you can't tell I'm clapping. Oh, like oh my God. Oh, it's so beautiful. Oh, Jesus Christ. Do you think there is that, is that an actual city, city, city? No, I'm well, pretty sure it's a model. It's no, I, know, a I, mean, I, mean, I mean, is that like an actual city in the movie, like on a spaceship? Oh, oh. Well, basically, it was just um, the... God help us all. The ship was basically uh, modeled after the San Fernando Valley lights. Yeah. Okay. Which we okay. saw, we, I believe we kind of saw, at least alluded to earlier in the movie, when he's looking over over the, over the city with the lights. What do you guys think of the uh, the choice to have the credits as the ship is ascending? I think that's great. I, yeah, I liked I it too. I thought it was a good yeah. move. Because I like it's the almost... here, though. I think this, this score right here is the best. This one just right here alone. It has like the climax in it, uh -huh. it's, like all soft and smooth, and then powerful and then smooth. It just—I don't know. I think this is the best part. <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. Truffo, I loved your book. <laughs> oh man, it's such a it's it's just such a like woman. as you know as the credits roll. It's like it almost kind of has this sort of like full circle, like you know, like quality where the movie never ends you know what i mean where yeah. it's like even as the credits are rolling we're still seeing this imagery we're still picturing us as roy on that ship you know we're still having all this emotion connected to what we just saw Ow. truth be told when they, that final alien came out of the ship and just you know greeted them i actually started crying on my first feeling <laughs> <laughs> Not like crying, crying, just, you know, like... Well, I mean, the emotion, the it, it's overwhelming. It, the emotion really is overwhelming in that scene, Ezra. I can see where you're coming from there. Just, uh, yeah, just, um, you know. All right, guys, so I guess we'll hit on some final thoughts. You guys want to go roundtable? Right. I'm still listening to the music. <laughs> 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 I told you. <laughs> this is some good ending music. Yeah, it is. It really is, yeah. <laughs> It kind of vaguely sounds like making Christmas. It kind of does. Oh yeah, you're right. It does sound a little bit like yeah. Right, right. Wow, well, yeah. It's powerful, and then it slows down, and then it starts uh -huh. building up again and slows down. Uh huh. So it's like a big Christmas present all wrapped in the one. Okay, okay. Just enjoying some Spielberg magic here, folks. Just don't oh, like yeah. us. But no, we have to get back to the same thing, so. I know, right? Characters and instance portray. If a lot of people <laughs> love each other, the world would be a better place to live. Special thanks to the Johnny Mathis. Chances are when you wish you could see The square true. song. When you wish upon the square song. Love, love song of the waterfall. Furnished. Two five zero six two. So yeah, uh, yeah. So uh, yeah, we should get around. Uh, Sandy, what do you got? Fun. Uh, Put me on the spot, Sandy. Yes. You know, it's it's. I don't. Well, I know. You know. <laughs> I have a big Spielberg retrospective book, which um got <laughs> which basically introduced me to Raiders of the Lost Ark. Um, and I know there's a lot of stuff. Up, there's a lot of stuff. Well, there is a lot of stuff about Close Encounters in that. Just never got to it. And you know, it's it definitely just it definitely does not uh, strike me the way Raiders or ET does. But I don't think it's supposed to. Um, it's, it does, does, just doesn't have that same kind of you know. Obviously, it doesn't have the same kind of pace and you know characters. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it's good in its own way. You know, it sure, has its, sure. it, it does its own thing. That's what I like about it. Right, it's, not anything, it, it, it's not really anything I can go out of my way to see, but I'm done. Oh. 
dragon. Right. Uh, uh, so I, uh, I think I had a really interesting experience with this movie because you know, I hadn't seen it in years. Because like, again, just kind of you collectively know it like you usually uh, you collectively know it for the third act, you know, for the big, you know, the kind of the Simon battle, and, you know, the pick picking Dreyfus, you know, the hand sign, all that stuff, and of course the mm-hmm. Williams score. It's kind of always the main take. But watching it, sort of finish after me, after these many years and a couple a couple sittings in different versions. I got to tell you. Uh, I, initially, again, the first view I had kind of a negative experience with it, where I was just looking at, it, like, again, it looks, it looks. It's uh, funny, Dragon. Like you told me you had that negative experience, and then I went in kind of trepidatious, like, oh man, this is gonna have like a super slow base to it. And I really like the experience I had. I'm, I'm sorry. I'll, I'll, I'll save this for my final thoughts. Go ahead. Well, anyway, I was. Uh... So initially coming out, I was just like, okay, well, so I guess this is sort of like, again, I understand why this is important to Spielberg. So, so it was recruiting and kind of like how it kind of maps out kind of the way he does things. And so essentially it was, I uh, came out with very my, I have changed my tune. So I'm just going to say my initial thought was that it was, uh, it was basically his Spielberg's avatar. And that again, it looks, looks great. It was a big game changer. Mm. For him. And I, again, initial. No. Initial. Initial. Okay. Okay. Cause I was like, I'm getting, mm. I'm, I'm going. All right. Just let me finish. So okay. the point <laughs> Initially, I was just coming out of it thinking, again, well, I was really trepidatious about it. Like, going after watch, like, oh man, it goes on for a long time. It's, it's. I mean, I look again. I can't, I can't take even from the first. I was so strikingly, it's beautiful, and it's. I understand why it was such a huge thing. It really shaped a lot of things. I, my fear was that, but my fear boiled down to is that maybe this is like we're so. Every other film has borrowed so much from this. I'm, I'm, it may have outdated itself, which obviously is not true. But initially, I was thinking maybe it outdated itself, making it kind of not able to rewatch it. But uh, rewatching it uh, is giving another, you know, an open-minded shot. and kind of watching it again here tonight. It's uh, I get again, I'm, I'm hit more by the emotion, and I'm more impressed by the structure. So there's more to it than I thought. I still have a few issues with it. Most of them are nitpicks, but uh, you know, I, I think st- it, it, it doesn't. I, I basically I understand it more than I ever thought I did, and uh, I understand it more. I have I have more respect for it, and uh, I um, it still doesn't eclipse any of my other Spielberg favorites. But I do again. I do. I I, I can't uh, ignore just kind of like the emotion. It kind of sh- stirs up in you, and kind of the kind of sure. simplistic beauty. It has like a simplistic beauty about it. It does. Again, it just it does. And if I ever just had this credit, I, I have to stick somewhat to the avatar thing. Only what I put it more politely as is that it's. Ooh, you son I, of a I, bitch! I'm getting there. Let me going. What it? What it? Uh, I'm, saying, <laughs> I'm the sorry. More, I'm the more literally night, pulling you right now, Dragon. I'm sorry. <laughs> the lighter, simplistic version of it is that it's just it's like it's it's a beautiful painting you're watching. It's like a two hour two two hour plus painting you're watching come to life. It's a work of art. Yeah, I guess the better thing is given the ending is it's a symphony. It's a, it's a symphony it's a work of art. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, Gabby. Hey. Okay. <laughs> I honestly don't have that many problems with the film. I really like the music. I like the pace of it. The I guess my only complaint would be the aliens. <laughs> that really would be my only complaint. Because it literally just felt like I said, they're just freaking, you know, little children or girls or whatever in a suit and a plaster head, okay? <laughs> And at one point when, you know, when, it's Gillian, right? I, I just don't want to say Jillian, but I don't know which one. It is Jillian. Yeah, it's, it's, it's Jillian. Jillian. Yeah. Okay, it's Jillian. So when Jillian's taking the photos, I mean, you see close up faces. Oh, I know, I know. Before the days of like, oh, Plato and Chicken Wire. I know, it's like, oh, God, this is horrible. <laughs> but other than that, I really liked it. Um, I think that, I don't know, I think it just went well together. I think it was a decent movie. I really don't have many problems with it. I think it, it just it worked well. It all went well together. Yep. And yeah, folks, I mean, this, uh, I definitely echo the sentiments like, Gabby, I'm sure you like this better than E.T., but... Oh, by far. <laughs> <laughs> However, I do know E.T. better than this movie because every year I get, like, the courage to watch E.T. Oh, God. <laughs> So even though I'm cringing the whole time, I actually know E.T. pretty well. All right. Have you seen the whole movie through through? Uh, yeah. I, I oh. think I've seen it like ten times. Oh, wow. Good for okay. you. But, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely in the same boat with, uh, with uh, you know, at least Dragon and uh, Sandy when it comes to, like, yeah, it's not as good as, like, Jaws. Uh, like it's not, uh, yeah, Jaws, E.T., oh, Jurassic no, Park. No, it's not as good, but at the same time, it's it, still It's not trying to be, like, this is This is movie. definitely, like, a, as Dragon said, it's a painting, it's a symphony, it's a work of art. And I think it's really interesting, because as we've kind of been doing throughout the it's commentary... A Stab- it's a Stab- Kubrick. 
Yes, yes. But as we've been doing throughout the commentary, we've just been like listing like all these different influences. Like, Dragon, I feel like the reason why it felt dated on your initial watch is because it almost sort of had that that effect of like, you know, like this is the thing that sort of paved the way for all the iconic imagery of Spielberg that we've gotten over the years. And this is where it originally came from. And so you kind of have that sort of been there, done that feel to it at first. But then when you really sit down and watch the movie, understand the characters, understand, you know, the like the, the point of the pacing and why the pacing is the way it is and the yeah. build, it really does come together into something truly beautiful, I think. Um, I really didn't know how I was going to feel rewatching this movie. I remember... I remember this movie, frankly, boring the shit out of me when I was a kid. I'm not going to lie. I'm really not going to lie. This movie just didn't do it for me at all when I was a kid. But, yeah, man, I mean, looking at this through adult eyes, it's it's a fucking beautiful work of art. And I'm really glad we chose it as the uh, the intro to Spielberg Month. So. All right. And uh, so next time on Spielberg Month, we will be ta- tackling... Um, <laughs> Appropriately as... Second installment. Yes. If Jurassic Park is my favorite Spielberg movie of all time, uh, The Lost World Jurassic Park might be my least favorite Spielberg movie of all time. Really? <laughs> yeah. Really? I got, I, oh, my I God. Hate, I, I have so many issues with The Lost World, but we're going to really talk do. about it. We're going to talk about it. Oh, it's going to be fun it. to see. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, let's just, let's just say, folks, The Lost World Jurassic Park is going to be a more lively commentary. It's not. It's definitely not going to be like, ooh, ah, this is so pretty. No, yeah, it, no. It's going to be... It's going to be bitter and cynical. That's yep, what the whole thing is going to be. Pretty much, like, what pretty the much. heck was... What the, hell, what the heck was he thinking? Oh, yeah, Spielberg, honestly, how could you do this it, to us? It's not... It. I, I've always had problems, even when I was a child with it. I yeah, was even like, when I was a kid, I agree, I agree, I agree. Not yeah, even Goldblum can save this. No, you watched the first one. one. of the problems with it. I think Goldblum is basically a proto-Jack Sparrow. All right, it's, all right, sorry, Gabe. <laughs> you watch the first one, and you're like, wow, this is absolutely amazing. And then you stumble upon this piece of crap, and you're like, yeah. what the hell? Just, what just happened? We just went from, oh, this amazing movie to, what the fuck is this? I'm I'll like, be going into it fresh. I have no idea what the big deal with it is quite yet. <laughs> okay. Uh, Okay, uh, so yeah, you know. it, I mean, it'll be a fun conversation. It'll probably be a, a more fun conversation than this. Most likely. I think this was an insightful conversation. That's going to yeah. be a fun conversation. We'll be like, and this dude did this. <laughs> this dude screwed up here. Okay. And what the hell was this plot for? Yeah, I, I, it's, 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 it's colorful. It is. It is. It is. <laughs> it's, it's. Dinosaur-y. Okay. <laughs> but in the meantime, folks, as we as we gaze at the spaceship going up into the stars and as we and as we dread the uh the uh, uh the, the, the uh gold bloom gold bloom to come <laughs> um <laughs> we we put to rest this installment of Spielberg Month and uh yeah, I, I got nothing. I need to come up with a legitimate <laughs> outro. I'm sorry. Well, at one point, Dragon started singing, and you were talking, so I'm like, is this our outro? Is this- <laughs> how, about the outro is, how about the outro is literally just us humming the, the theme music to whatever movie? No, how about God. No. <laughs> dun, dun, dun.